Right. So once again, good morning to everybody. Um, in today's lesson, we want to look at ecology, what ecology is all about. Now, basically, ecology is a study of living things, you know, um, and how they interact with each other and their physical environment. Okay, so that's it, what e ecology means. Remember anything with ology study, right? Ology study or something. Okay, so interaction of living things with each other and their physical environments. Okay. Yeah. Now, the, the living things on Earth may be organized into four different levels of what we call ecological organization. Ecological organization. Um, these levels are, we have population. Population. So let's define population. You have to know the definitions of some of these words. You know, as I said, the list that I gave to you has all the definitions over there. So when you get a chance, take a look at, at that. You know, it has extra definitions that I would like you to know about. So the, what's the population? When I say population, we are talking about all the members of one species in an area, all the members of one species in an area. That's what we call a population. For example, I can have like a dog population. So let's say this is dog population, same species, cat population, human population. So you have same species in an area. So let's write this down as population. Population. So each of these. Okay. They have to give come to the word community. Community. So the community refers to all members of different interacting species. So here all members of the different interacting species in an area, right? So it means that you are putting all the different populations together. So I'm putting this, this, and that. All of them together for what we call the community. So if I can represent that here, then all this will form the community. Okay. Then we talk about the ecosystem. The ecosystem refers to all members of the community plus the abiotic factors influencing them. Okay, abiotic. A means like non, non-living, right? A. So biotic is living organisms. So one of the definitions, if you look at the list that I give to you, I have definition for biotic and abiotic. You know, they're all there. So biotic means like living things, abiotic, non-living. So all the members in the community plus the abiotic factors influencing them. So we're talking about like humidity, the humidity. We are talking about temperature. We are talking about um, like the, the wind and so on, you know. All these things are abiotic factors, the you know, non-living factors that influence the organisms. Okay. So the community, all that you have here, plus plus the all the factors around which are abiotic factors. Okay. If you put all this together, all right, then we are looking at the ecosystem. The ecosystem. 
Okay. Then the word biosphere. The biosphere is refers to the entire region of the earth where living things can be found. You know, entire region of the earth where living things can be found. And that forms the biosphere. You know, bio is like living. Anything bio is living thing. So where you find living things on the earth or the all the parts of the earth for the biosphere. Okay. So those are some few definitions that you should know for ecology, in addition to the other ones that I gave out to you. So when you get a chance, get that from the Google Classroom. Great. So let's delve into some nutritional interactions. Now, all the ecosystem must have three basic kinds of nutritional interactions in order to be stable and self-sustaining, right? These nutritional interactions involve what we call producers, consumers, and decomposers. This is a very important topic. You know, I know definitely you have questions on, on these things, and I'll show you how sort of questions are asked. But you have to know the definitions to, to apply them. Uh, you have producers, you have consumers, and you have decomposers. These three things are key to answering questions, right? Producers, consumers, and decomposers. What are the producers? Now, the producers are organic, is, is, is a producer is an organism that is capable of trapping the sun's energy to make glucose sugar in the process of photosynthesis, right? So in other words, the producers can produce their own food. A producer can produce their own food, okay, very key. So another word that we use to represent producers is the word autotroph. You see autotroph means self-feeding or self produce their own food. And then how do they produce their food? They use sunlight, photosynthesis, okay? So basically these are like plants, you know, plants and algae. So plants and algae are examples of producers. They need sunlight in order, in order to make um, the, the, the food, which is glucose, okay? So producers. So keyword, they need sun energy to make their food. Okay, so. Then we have the consumers. A consumer prefers organisms that depend and eat other organisms for their food. They depend on other organisms for their food, right? In other words, they cannot make their own food. Another key term for the consumer is the word heterotroph. Heterotroph. So they ask you what is heterotroph? Organisms that cannot manufacture their own food. Autotrophs, organisms that can produce their own food. Okay, so those are two key words that you should also look out for. Okay. There are different levels of consumers, different levels. But let's begin with the types first, and then we'll talk about the different levels. Um, the first type is the herbivore, herbivore. So the herbivore, that's an organism that feeds on plant material. So you have to know what a herbivore is. You should be able to identify them in what we call a food chain or food web when we get to those type of problems. Then carnivore, they feed on other animals, you know, like dogs. Herbivore will be like um, sheep. Omnivore. They consume both plants and animals. Like human beings, we are omnivores. We, can, we, we, we eat plants, we eat animals. And then the third type of consume, consumer, uh, consumers is the, no, sorry, I said third type. The other class, other group of um, nutrition interaction is the decomposer, the decomposers. Is a group by itself, decomposes, right? So the decomposers is a special category of uh, consumer 
organisms, special category. You know. And um, the composers break down organic matter and change it into simpler nutrients, which can be recycled in the ecosystem. Okay. So they are like recyclers, the composers. They break down organic matter. They change them into simple nutrients that go back into the environment. Okay. An example of decomposers would be bacteria and fungi. Bacteria and fungi. These are some examples of decomposers. So once the organism dies, you know, they break it down and then release the nutrients into the back into the environment to be reused. Okay. So those are some of the terms that you should know to be able to answer questions related to um, food chain and food web. Okay. Right. So let's begin by looking at the basic concept of what we call the food chain. The food chain. And this is how the food chain looks like. So the food chain is a single chain showing one organism eating, eating by another, right? Which is in turn is eating by another organism. So it's like one organism feeds on one another and then the another organism feeds on that one and so on, okay? So it's a chain of nutritional interactions. And it always begins with, with a producer. Okay, you start with a producer. So you have a producer, and they have the organism feeds on the producer, it's known as a primary organism. Okay, the primary organism. And then the one that feeds on the primary organism is the secondary organism. Then the one that feeds on secondary organism is known as the tertiary organism, and so on. It, it, it keeps going. I can add one more level, quaternary. You know, I can add another level as a quaternary consumer. You know. Now most levels will end like by the tertiary consumer will, will be done. So producers, primary consumer, secondary consumer, and tertiary consumer. Okay. Those are the basic diagram. So let's look at an example. Okay. So if I look at this example, I have grass. Then I have grasshopper. Then I have a toad, a snake, and a hawk. All right, so how do you read this? This means that grass is eaten by a grasshopper or grass produces food for the grasshopper. A grasshopper produces food for the toad or is eaten by the toad. Toad is eaten by the snake. Snake is eaten by the hawk and so on. So when they give you a diagram like this, you just follow the arrow. Just follow the arrow and you know, trace the arrow without taking off your pen and then you know what is happening, okay? So you want to read backwards, it means hawk produces food for snake, snake produces food, sorry, hawk feeds on snake, snake feeds on toad, toad feeds on grasshopper, grasshopper feeds on grass. Okay. They don't break the chain, okay? So that's a basic food chain, right? Then we can have so many food chains put together when you have so many food chains put together to form a complex system, we call that a food web, right? So the food web is made up of several food chains put together, you know? So these interconnect, interconnected food chains form what you call a food web. So let's look at this diagram here. I'm gonna trace one food web within this for you to see. So one will be, let's start, we start with the grass, right, grass. So grass is a producer. Okay. 
Now, the, so the grass produces food for the rabbit and following the arrow. Rabbit is food for the hawk that goes here. So this is one food chain ends on the hawk right here. So one possible food chain, right? So I have grass to rabbit. Rabbit food for hawk. So that's one food chain that I see here. Okay. You know, this type of questions, when they give you, you don't have to think too hard. The answers are within the diagram. Yes. So when we come here, I see that grass is going to be an example of a producer. So this is a producer. So they can ask you to identify the producer in the diagram. The rabbit, since is the first to feed on the grass, will be the primary consumer. Then the hawk is a next level to feed on the primary. So it's going to be secondary. Consumer. And so on. So that's one food chain here. One food chain. I can identify another food chain. Let me use a different. Let me get rid of this one and then we'll highlight again. All right. So I start with producer. I can go to rabbit, rabbit to snake. So food for snake and a snake food for the hawk. That's another food uh, chain. So I see a second one, grass. Food for rabbits. Rabbit produces food for the snake. And snake produces food for the hawk. Okay. So if you look at this one, then the producer will be grass, rabbit, primary consumer, snake secondary, and a hawk will be the tertiary consumer. You know, tertiary consumer. So that's how you can read this. And, and I can see another food chain. Okay, that's grass, food for grasshopper, grasshopper food, food for toad. Toad produces food for, is a food for the snake, and snake is food for the hawk. So that's another food chain right there. Okay, so we see three food chains put together in this particular food web, grass, grasshopper, food for toad, toad is food for snake, and snake is food for the hawk. Okay, so this is a primary, secondary, this is toad will be no, no, let me start all over. So grass is producer, grasshopper will be the primary consumer, toad will be secondary consumer, snake will be the tertiary consumer, and then a the hawk will be the like quaternary consumer. Right? So three food chains put together, you had a food web. So it's complex system of interaction. Then there's another type of diagram known as a food web, sorry, food pyramid, the food pyramid, this one. So the food pyramid is, is a pyramid that shows the feeding relationships between organisms, okay, food pyramid. So this is a food example of a food pyramid. It follows the same pattern. So, a food pyramid shows feeding relationship between organisms. You have the base, always the base here. These are producers are here. Producers or the autotroph. Okay. And an example I say this grass. 
So I've grass here. They had a primary consumer here, primary. They have secondary consumer and a tertiary consumer. So those are the different levels. Okay. So you have example of grass, grasshopper, toad, and then maybe a snake. Okay, something like that. That's a food pyramid. Okay. So as you go higher up the pyramid, the number of organisms become bigger and fewer, right? So the base is wider or broader because you need more of organisms at that level, you know, to produce food for the next level, right? So that's how it's like tippers as you go up. So it was it's a change in the size of one population in the food chain will affect other populations. So the question that they ask you will be related to things like this, you know, changes that occur in one population, you know, how does it affect other, the other populations? Okay, so we'll look at some examples like this. So let's look at this here. Say, say this interdependence of populations within a food chain helps to maintain the balance of plant and animal populations within a community. For example, when there are too many grasshoppers, there will be insufficient trees and shrubs for all of them to eat. Many grasshoppers will starve and die. Fewer grasshoppers means more time for the trees and shrubs to grow to maturity and multiply. Fewer grasshoppers, grasshoppers also means less food is available for the toads to eat, and some toads will starve to death. So when there are fewer toads, the grasshopper population will increase, right? So I have a question like, predict the effect of low population of snakes in the pyramid above, okay? Example, so if, in other words, if the snake population goes down, so we have the snake, this is a snake population. The, the, at, 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 at the peak here, you have the snake population here. Snake. So the snake population, if it goes down, what's gonna to happen to the population of toads? Then you expect the population of toads to increase. The toad population will increase, right? It's gonna increase because you don't have snakes to feed on them. So the population would increase. If the snake population goes down, if the snake population increases, then the two population would increase and so on. Okay? So changes in one population affects the other. We can do the same thing with the food, chain, uh, food web here. Okay, I can ask the question, maybe what's gonna happen? What's the likely um, thing that will happen to the, let's say the snake population. Let's go back to the snake population here. What will happen to the snake population? So we're looking at the snake population here. If let's say that the rabbit population goes down, right? Rabbit, rabbit population goes down. So let's predict that. Rabbit, rabbit population is down. So it means that this is, it's not getting food from here. So let's cross that out. Okay, you're gonna cross that out. So food is not coming from the rabbits. Okay, so we have to ask ourselves, is there any source of food for the snake? Yes, there is. When we come, we see a toad. The toad is producing food for the snake here. Okay, it's producing food for the snake. So, it's unlikely that there'll be a change in the snake population because it has another source of food. There's an alternative source of food for it. So the snake population is still likely to, you know, so, to remain on change. Okay, so that that would be one of the options. You know, they may say, or oh, the snake population will go down. The snake population will increase, or the, it's, it's unlikely to change. It may be D. I don't know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> things like that. You know. So once there's a source of food, the population is likely to remain the same. You know? 
Now, let's look at another prediction. What will, will be the, um, the likely effect on the population of toad if let's say the grasshopper population goes down? So we're looking at toad population. If the grasshopper population goes down, okay, so it means that this is no more there. What's gonna to happen to the population for toad? Now the toad has only one source of food from this diagram. See, when you're answering this type of questions, your focus should only be on the diagram. Whatever diagram is given to you. You don't have to think about anything else. Don't bring in any ideas from outside and say, oh, it's likely to get food from this. No, 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 no. Focus on what the diagram is given and on the diagram given to you and answer the question based on the diagram. You know, where the answer is in the diagram. So don't guess yourself and bring your other ideas, you know. <laughs> so if the grasshopper population goes down, then there's no food for the toad based on this diagram. No other food. So it means that toad population will go down or they'll die off. You know? So that's how you use this diagram to answer questions. Then you could also ask a question, have a question like, which of, the, well, which of these organisms is the producer? Which of these organisms is the producer? So you come to the grass. The grass is a producer because it needs sunlight to, to make its own food. It manufactures its own food, so it's a producer. Okay. Which of the following is a primary consumer? So primary feeding on the producer. So the first level of consumption. So you have grasshopper and they have rabbits, first level and so on. Okay, so, so those are different questions that can be asked. Now, there's one important member of the food chain and the food web and the food pyramid that is not shown on the diagram. Very important member, but it's not shown. And that member is the decomposers. So you take note of that, the decomposers. Okay, so they are important members of the food chain and the food web, but they are not shown on the di diagram. So important members not shown on the food chain or web. So if they ask you a question like that, the answer is decomposes, decomposes. Right. So with this knowledge, you should be able to answer a lot of questions that they ask on this type of problems, food chain and food web. Um, does anybody have any question so far? Okay. All right, so think about that questions like these. Okay. Now, the other feeding relationship that we're gonna talk about, long-term, these are long-term feeding relationships, long-term. And we use the word symbiosis, symbiosis. Okay, to represent, to refer to long-term relationship, feeding relationship between organisms. Okay. And there are four categories of symbiosis. The first one is parasitism. Second is known as mutualism. Third is saprophytism. And then the fourth is commensalism. Four groups of symbiosis, long-term relationships. So what is parasitism? The, 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 the words will tell, tell you what it means within, you know, if you forget, think about a word. Parasite, parasitism. So under this type of relationship, one organism feeds on another, the key facts are 
feet on another, one of them feeds on another, and then causes injury, injury or harm to it. Yeah. So the key word is causing harm or injury to the organism. Okay. So there's no harm to the organism. You cannot have parasitism. So think of like a parasite in our body, it causes injury or harm, damage. Now, examples of this would be like bed bugs feeding on the blood of humans. That's parasitism. It's causing injury to the human. Now, tapeworm in the intestines of human, the tapeworms they feed on the, in, the, the blood on, in the intestine. So they're causing damage. So that's parasitism. Think of the malaria parasite called Plasmodium falciparum. It causes malaria in humans and it's, it's causing injury. Okay, so in a relationship where one causes damage to the, the other one, the other one doesn't get any benefits, you know, just being damaged. So you have a parasitic relationship. So when they ask you some of these examples, look for injury or harm. If it's causing harm, then you think about this parasitism. Then the next relationship, mutualism, mutualism. So think of mutual. Mutual means, you know, equal, equal. So equal benefits, this is what we see here. So this type of association, you have both organisms benefiting from the relationship. So both organisms benefit from the relationship. So when I give you examples, ask yourself, are both organisms benefiting? If they are, they are dealing with mutualism. Okay, and these are some examples, common examples that are given. One is the auspecker. The auspecker is a kind of bird, right? It lands on the back of zebras and rhinos. And what they do is that they eat ticks and other parasites that live on their skin. Now the auspeckers get food and the rhinos or the zebras, they are relieved of the pest. So auspecker is getting food, the rhinos and zebras are relieved of the pest. Okay, so we see an example like this. Now ask you what kind of relationship do you have in this? Okay, they tell you the story that I'm telling you here, this particular example. Okay, what kind of relationship? Then you have to identify, say, Auspecker is getting food, so it's benefiting. Rhinos are relieved of the pest. So the rhinos is also benefiting. Got it, you know, got it. The pests are sucking the blood of the rhino and or the zebras. So they are being relieved of it. So both are benefiting because they are both benefiting. You have a mutual um, mutualism here. Okay. Mutual benefits. Okay. Now another example. The spider crab and algae. The spider crab and algae. Now the spider crabs live in shallow areas of the ocean floor where they are easily preyed upon by other sea creatures, right? So they are preyed upon by other sea creatures. The greenish algae, brown, the greenish brown algae lives on the back of the crabs, right? So this makes them blend in with their environment so that they become unnoticeable to the predators. They both benefit because the algae gets good place to live. So the algae on the back of the crab, they have a good place to live. And now the crab also gets camouflaged. It gets camouflaged, you know, by the algae because the algae is blending the environment, you know. So there's a crab there, algae on its back. So it's blending the environment. So the crab size is a little thin. To be eaten by the predators. So algae and crab, they are benefiting from each other, but beneficial relationship. So that's an example of mutualism. 
neutralism. Another example is a bee and a flower. Bees fly from flower to flower gathering nectar, which they turn into food, into their food, right? That's what they're going to use to produce their, their honey. While feeding on the nectar, the bees get some pollen on their hairy bodies. The pollen is transferred to the next flower when the bee lands on it, leading to pollination. Now, so in this mutualistic relationship, the bees get food, they get a nectar, and then the flowering plants, they get, the flag, they get to reproduce. Okay, so both are benefiting. Food from the flower, and then bees, they help in pollination. The pollen sticks on their body and they transfer it to other flowers. So beneficial relationship. So that's, this is our example of mutualism, mutual benefits, okay. You can get examples like this. Then we have commensalism, commensal, commensalism. So in commensalism, one organism benefits. Here, only one organism is gonna benefit. So one organism benefits, but the other does not benefit or get injured. Okay, there's no injury, there's no benefit to the other one. So only one organism benefits. So that's a key statement here. Only one organism. benefits. Okay, key. It's no injury or harm to the other one. Now, examples of commensalism. See, if you want the natural, National Geographic, sometimes you see some of these um, relationship on the TV, or those, some of the science programs where they show the wildlife. Right, so example of commensalism, the shark and the remora fish, the shark and the remora fish. So if you watch those underwater programs, you see the shark swimming and have these small, small fishes swimming on the side of it, you call it remora. Now the remora fish feeds on the crumbs that fall out of the mouth of the shark. All right, so the shark feeds on like large food particles. So once they chew them and break it down to pieces, the crumbs fall out of their mouth. And what happens? The remora fish comes to feed on the crumbs that fall out of the mouth of the shark, right? So to the shark, that's a waste product. You don't need it, the food is falling out. But the remora fish is benefiting from this relationship, getting food. So see the remora fish benefits from the feeding, feeds on the crumbs, but the shark does not benefit or lose anything doesn't benefit or lose anything. So only the remora is benefiting in this relationship. So we call that a commensalism, commensal relationship. So the remora fish will be like a commensal. Another example that you also see in the, on, you see on the TV, you see the cattle and the cattle egrets, what we call the cattle and cattle egrets. The cattle, Egrets are birds. They live near cattle. When the cattle graze, their movements stir up insects. So when they are feeding, by moving their legs, they stir up the grass, and then you see the inst insects um, flying off. Now the birds have their the birds feed on the insects, right? So they now in this relationship, you have the, the birds have the insects. So the birds have the insects, and the cattle are unaffected. So since the birds are the only one benefiting, this relationship is known as the uh, commensal, uh, commensalism. Commensalism. Only one organism is benefiting. Okay. And then the last example of long-term relationship is saprophytism. Saprophytism, saprophyte. When you say saprophyte, we we'll look at what that means. So saprophytism, this relationship involves organisms feeding on non-living things. Organisms feeding on non-living things. 
So these are the non-living things. Okay. Now the organisms are referred to as saprophytes. Example, if you think of the mold and the bread, mold is a living organism, all right, it's a fungus that feeds on bread, which is non-living, okay? So the mold is a saprophyte. But it's feeding on non-living thing, okay? So these are the four different types of relationship that you know about, okay? Parasitism, commensalism, neutralism, and saprophytism, saprophytism. Four key, four key things. All right. Any questions on these things? Because that brings us to the end of the nutritional interactions and the food web, food chain, and so on. So I believe we should be able to answer questions on these easily. Okay, so as I said, I made a little um, practice quiz on that. I'll send it out to you after the class so you can, you can work on that. A lot of the definitions. Okay, good. Now let's switch our minds to some chemistry, back to some chemistry. And the Topic we're looking at now will be mixtures. Mixtures. When we say a mixture, we are talking about two or more substances which have combined such that each substance retains its own chemical identity. So we have nothing has changed, like the chemically, nothing has changed, you know. So this is like a fiscal reaction, fiscal reaction, it's not a chemical reaction. There's no chemical reaction here. So that is a combination of substances which are not chemically combined. Okay, there's no chemical change here. There's a physical combination. All right, so the key characteristics of a mixture are they have the same properties as their components, all right? So if I mix something like sugar and salt, sugar is still there, salt is still there. Okay, so you have a mixture, nothing changed. They retain their properties. There is no fixed proportion between the components. No fixed proportion. I can mix them anyhow. You know, in chemical reactions, you need fixed proportion. Let's say if I want to form water, I need oxygen and hydrogen. How many hydrogens do I need? I need two hydrogens and one oxygen. So that's a fixed, it's two to one ratio. So that's a fixed proportion. Okay. In chemical, in chemical reactions. But here, it's a physical thing that we are doing. There's no chemical reaction here. So there's no fixed proportion. Okay, so I can add any amount of salt, any amount of sugar and mix them up. Then the third component is the fact that you can separate the component. This component can be separated. So these are three important characteristics of a mixture retain their properties, you can separate the components and there's no fixed proportion between the components. Okay. Three key things. And these are examples of mixtures. A mixture of sugar and salt, okay. Air is a mixture of gases. You have nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. Okay, they all retain their properties. A mixture of flour and sugar, salt and sand mixture salt and water, okay? I can always get back the salt by some process, and I can also get back the water by some process. You can get the components back. So that is a mixture, okay? There's no fixed combination between the two. I can add an amount of water to the salt or more salt to the water. There's no fixed combination and we can separate the components. So it meets the criteria, a three criteria for mixture, all of them. So there are different ways of separating the components, right? And I think we're going to talk about some of the ways um, shortly, how to separate mixtures, okay? 
something I can use for the cough filtration. Okay, if I have salt and water, salt and water, if you want to separate this component, to separate this, you can, you can use evaporation. You can evaporate the water and then you get a salt, all right? So you can separate this by evaporation. To separate the components here. Okay. If I have something like uh, what do you call it? Um, maybe sand and water. Like sand and water. If I have sand plus water mixture. I can separate this using filtration. So you can filter, you know, so filtration can use to separate like the sand and water, you know. You can also, certain things you can use distillation and so on. If I have two liquids, you know, that, uh, mixed together and they have different properties, different, uh, what do you call it? Fiscal properties, different and boiling points. I can use distillation to separate them. The way they make petroleum, gas, and the, uh, that we use, the kerosene, bitumen, and so on. They, they take the coal uh, they, they, and then, then separate, heat it up and then separate the components. Good. And then have all those different gases, diesel, kerosene, and so on, petrol and so on. Those are all processes that can be used to separate mixtures. So what are the types of mixtures that we know of? There are three types of mixtures, three types. And I would advise that you know, you learn some of the examples of each of these. So when I ask what's an example of the following, be sure to say what they are. Okay, I'll give you the examples as we go on. <clears throat> so three types of mixtures. You have solutions, that's one. You have suspensions and then colloids. Solution, suspensions, and colloids. Those are three types of mixtures. So what is a solution? Now, a solution is a homogeneous mixture. I'm going to highlight that homogeneous mixture. Okay. You got to know what the word homogeneous means. Now, homogeneous means that there's no boundary that is visible in the entire solution. All right. So if I take salt and water, I use that as an example. If I put salt and water. I don't see any boundary here, right? I don't see any boundary when I look at it, the whole solution. Okay, because of that, we say that this is homogeneous. Homogeneous mixture. No boundaries are visible. Okay. In other words, we say that this has what we call only one phase. has only one phase, P-H-A-S-E, one phase, okay? No boundary can be seen, All right? If I have something like, uh, if I take maybe water and I have oil, oil and water, if I look at this, I see two phases, right? I see two, a boundary. There's a boundary between the water and the oil. So it's a boundary. If it's a boundary, then we, we refer to that as a heterogeneous mixture. Heterogeneous mixture. Heterogeneous means that you can see a boundary between the 
components. Okay, so know that two things, homogeneous and heterogeneous. Okay, but here we're talking about solution. So the solution has only one phase, no boundary sin. Okay, so let's read this statement again. A solution is a homogeneous mixture of a solute in a solvent. Solute in a solvent, right? So for you to make a solution, we need a solute and a solvent. Homogeneous means no boundary is visible in the entire solution. The major component is called a solvent, the major component. So the water is a solvent here. There's a solvent. And the salt will be the solute, which is a minor component, right? The major component is a solvent the one that does a dissolving. And then what you put in at the salt is a solute. Salt is a solute here. Okay. So that dissolved substance is known as a solute and then the substance that does, does the dissolving is known as a solvent. For example, a salt solution. The water is a solvent and the salt is a solute. The component in the solution may not be separated from the solution by leaving it or, or by um, filtration, right? So if I filter this, I cannot get a component back. It, it can get it back through filtration, salt in water. You can use filtration here, you know? And if I leave it, they don't separate. Okay, that makes it homogeneous. Okay, you don't see any boundaries. Okay. Um, another example is sugar in water. It's an example of homogeneous mixture, which is a solution. Okay, so note this example. Now there are degrees of saturation, different degrees of saturation. A solution can be saturated, it could be unsaturated, or super saturated. Okay. Now we say that a solution is unsaturated if it can dissolve more solutes at a given temperature. So at any given temperature, let's say room temperature, if I put salt in water, it dissolves, right? But so I add more, you keep dissolving, add more, you keep dissolving. So if you keep dissolving, we say that it is unsaturated. It dissolving more solute at a particular temperature, at, at that room temperature. Now a solution is saturated if no more solutes can be dissolved with the temperature remaining constant. So again, still at the room temperature. I can keep adding the salt or the sugar to the water and I keep dissolving. But it gets to a point where I keep adding and doesn't dissolve again. You see the sugar particles or the, or the salt at the bottom of the water. When you get to that level at that room temperature, the temperature you're dealing with, right, a given temperature, if it doesn't dissolve again, then you say that the solution is saturated. We're doing a saturated solution. Now, what happens if I increase the temperature? If I increase the temperature, more will dissolve, right? So, one key point is that temperature. affects the rate at which substances dissolve. So temperature affects the rate solutes dissolve. In a solvent. Okay. So if you increase the temperature, more will dissolve, right? So if I start boiling water in the solution, I can keep adding more salt to it. So I can keep adding more and add more and keep adding more. Now it's gonna to get to a point where no matter what I do, when I keep increasing, it's not gonna dissolve any more of the solvent. If I keep adding, sorry, any more, any more of the solutes the more of the solute. If I keep adding the solute, at that point, we say that the solution is super saturated. Okay, 
So a super saturated solution contains more solutes than it can it will dissolve at. Uh, let, let me read this again. A saturated solution contains more solutes than it would if the dissolved solutes were in equilibrium with the undissolved so, uh, solutes. Right. So you cannot add. If you keep adding more, it's still not going to dissolve because you've reached a point of equilibrium. The dissolved and undissolved, they are in equilibrium. So no more can go into the solution. So th those are the level of saturation. Then we come to suspension. Suspensions. A suspension is a mixture of liquids, mixture of liquids with particles of a solid. So a mixture of liquids with particles of a solid, which may not dissolve in the liquid. Okay. Now the solid may be separated from the liquid by leaving it to stand or by filtration. <coughs> You can separate them by filtration or leaving it to stand. Okay. So think of suspension like that. If we think of some of the medications for children, you know, you put it down and then you see the particles separating. They have the liquid separating from those solid uh, the, the, the partic the particles. Like you put a powder in water, if you shake it, then it's pressed out in the, so in the liquid. Leave it, it separate. The, those are suspensions. Example of sand in water. If I have sand, fine sand particles in water, let's say clay in water. If I shake it, it appears to mix. And then if you leave it separate, that is an example suspension. Then you have colloids. Colloids. The colloids are a little bit in between like a solution and a suspension, right? It's in between that. So these are homogeneous non-crystalline substances. They consist of large molecules or particles of one substance dispersed through a second substance. Okay. So you see only one boundary, homogeneous, just one boundary. No, 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 I mean, no, not boundary. One face, I have to use the right words here, one face. Homogeneous don't have, it's only boundaries. You have just one face, okay, no boundaries seen, you know. In a colloid. So you have light particles that are dispersed through a second um, substance. Example of colloids are like gels, salts, emulsions, right? The particles do not set settle and cannot be separated out by ordinary filtration or centrifuging like those in a suspension. So as I said, it's in between suspension and um, solution. Okay. Emotion, examples of emotion. No, for these, no examples, some of the examples. When I say emotion, this is a fine dispersion of minute droplets of one liquid in, an, in, in another in which it is not soluble or mix, miscible, right? So one liquid, you have one liquid dispersed in another liquid. They don't, it doesn't, there's no, um, it's not soluble in that solution, in, in, in that um, substance, it's not soluble or miscible, right? So that is a colloidal suspension of one liquid in another, one liquid in another. Now emotions may be temporary or permanent. You can have a permanent emotion or temporary emotion. Temporary ones separate when left to stand for some time, okay? An example of that would be like oil and vinegar. If you put oil in vinegar, you have a temporary motion. 
mayonnaise. Mayonnaise that's egg yolk in oil, All right? Egg yolk put in oil. That is an example of emotion. So think about how it looks like, but this is a permanent emotion because it doesn't separate. And then so, so you have these the colloidal suspensions of small solid particles in a continuous liquid medium. So here you have suspension of small solid particles in a liquid medium. Okay, example would be like blood pigmented ink or paints, right? This is our example of soil. If the dispersion medium is water, the colloid is referred to as hydrosol. So when we say hydrosol, it means the medium you're using is water, a solid dispersed in water, then it's hydrosol. If it's air, in the medium that is being used is air, they have aerosol. Right, aerosol. So solid particles dispersed in a continuous liquid medium. So no examples like blood, pigmented ink, paints, examples of soil. And they have gels. Gels are colloids in a more solid form than soils, right, gels. So think of those jelly, jelly things. So the dispersed phase has combined with the dispersion medium to produce a semi-solid material. Example, jelly. Okay, so it forms a semi-solid material. So jelly is an example here. So if they give you these examples, you should to determine where they fall. So mayonnaise, oil and vinegar, and so on. Paint, jelly, no way to fall. Okay, all right, great. So this should be enough for mixtures and the different types of mixtures that we have. Any questions before we look at the next topic here? All right, it's so far so good. <laughs> okay. Right, now let's look at another simple diagram here called the electroscope. So physics, electroscope. Now the electroscope is very simple equipment and we use that to detect the presence of static electricity okay electroscope used to detect the presence of static electricity okay. for example if i comb my hair with in a comb the comb becomes charged you know and i can use that to attract pieces of paper and that's known as static electricity you know separation of the electrons within that material creates that static electricity. Okay. And that's what happens when you, let's say winter is very cold and you just come from outside, you remove your gloves and touch up, then door knob, it gives you that shock, the static. And it consists of two thin metal leaves. So that this is a diagram. It has, it has two thin metal leaves. These are the metal leaves here. And those leaves can be like gold, gold leaves. So the A label here, these are the gold, like gold leaves, metal leaves here. Suspended from a metal hook, so the B, is a hook we're talking about here, the metal hook. And then you have this as a plate. 
and C is the like a just like a, a bottle or jar. A glass jar. So how do you use this? Very simple. If a negatively charged body is brought near the terminal of the electroscope, it will cause electrons to be repelled to the metal leaves. So let me bring a charged object here. A charged object, for example, I bring, let's say I comb my hair with A rubber, a rubber comb, and I bring it here. If I comb my head, it's going, the rubber is going to have a charge. Let's say that the charge is negative. The negative charges within the rubber, for example. If I bring this close to the jar, so I'm talking about negative charges in this. Let me redraw this a little nicer and bigger. So negative charges, negative, negatives. If I bring it to the plate here, what it does is that the negative charges will attract positive charges in the system. So the plate here is going to become positive charge. Opposite charges attract, so the plate positive charges will be attracted to the plate here. And then the gold leaves will have a negative charge because all the negative charges will be repelled away from the plate towards the leaves like this, okay? Because they are opposite charges. Now what is happening here? Because initially the leaves are close together, okay? So once each of them gain negative charge, because opposite charges repel, their plates will spread apart. They move away from each other because they're repelling each other. So when that happens, they know there's a charge on the object that you brought close to the plate. You know, so it's used to detect the presence of charges. Let's try another one here. Now, assuming the object I bring here is positively charged. If I bring it to the plates, it's gonna attract the opposite charges. So now I'm gonna have negative charge coming to the plates from this system, attract the negatives. It's gonna repel all the positive away from the plates. So the gold leaves will end up being positive. Initially, remember they are together before, and they are close together. You know, so if they become positive charge, what's going to happen? The plates will move away from each other, so they're going to spread apart. You know, so that will show you that there's a charge in the material that you brought close to the plates. There's a charge there. If there's no charge on it, then the plates will not move apart. So that's how you use this simple electroscope. Okay. So you can have a question where they ask you, what happens to the plates when you bring a particular charge? So what happens to gold leaves, you know, when you bring a certain charge close to the plates, like that, the different scenarios that I gave you, you can have that on the question. They move away, they move closer to each other, you know, nothing changes all of above, you know, and then she will to choose the correct answer. All right, so that is how you use the electroscope here. So I have here that a positively charged body attracts electrons out of the leaves, okay? Um, in either case, the leaves are now charged the same way as each other. And so they repel each other, you know? The amount they open up is proportional to the charge of this source. So that's also very important to 
remember the amount the open up is proportional to the charge of the source. So in other words, the bigger or the larger the charge on the object that you bring here, the more the leaves move away from each other. Okay, it's proportional to the charge of the source. Okay, yeah. so that's the electroscope. Right, so we're getting closely to the end gradually. Now let's talk about waves, waves, the different types of waves that we have. Also know this very well. It give you a diagram to identify different parts of the wave as I'm going to do. Now there are different types of waves. We have what we call a mechanical wave and electromagnetic waves. A mechanical wave requires a medium for its transmission, whilst electromagnetic wave does not. Very important. Mechanical wave requires a medium. So a medium required for its transmission. Electromagnetic wave does not require a medium. An example of this mechanical wave is sound. So sound wave is a mechanical wave. Why? Because sound wave needs a medium to travel through. It is a vacuum. You cannot have sound traveling. You know, there's vacuum here. If I, as I speak, you're not going to hear me. It needs air. Sound needs air to travel through, or another any air medium like water or something like that. Solid wood, etc. There should be something present for sound to pass through. So it's an example of a mechanical wave. When you take light, light waves are electromagnetic waves. Light doesn't need any medium to travel through. It can travel in vacuum, you know. So it's an example of electromagnetic wave, electromagnetic wave. Okay. So when I ask you examples, you should be able to state them. Now there's something called like transverse and um, Transverse wave sound is also known as a trans. It's, it's like a, a what we call a long, longitudinal wave, longitudinal. In other words, when it's traveling, you have what we call compressions and decompressions. So if sound is traveling, you see that like, let's say this at one point you have compressions, and then this compress at one point. At that point, there's no compressions and so on. So it's called, called it a, a longitudinal wave. And they have what are called transverse waves. Transverse waves, like light, almost like traveling, they have like X and Y axis type of thing. Vertical motion, horizontal motion. And then that is what you call like a transverse wave, vertical. And horizontal components. Um, but the important thing for this is to know mechanical wave and the electromagnetic waves for this test. So let's look at the properties of wave. That one you have to know that very well. So I have a simple wave here, you know, when you draw the graph of a wave, traveling in a medium. You have X and Y, so this is like X and Y axis.
x and y axis here. And then on this axis, you have, let's say time, right? The time that we were traveling. So this is like time here. And then this is the, called the displacement. On the y axis, you have what called the displacement of the wave. So displacement, let's use D for displacements. Oh, uh, just writing words, displacements. So keep in mind, displacement is on the y-axis here. How far the wave is from original position, right? So this is the starting point. We use it, let's call it O, zero for the starting point. The wave has what we call an amplitude, amplitude, right? So the reference point is this x-axis. That's not the reference line. Reference line. So this is the reference line. Okay, like the starting point. O is the origin. Okay, where it's starting from. Okay. Now, the amplitude is a maximum displacement from the resting position. The, resting, the reference line is also known as the resting position. So let's write all those terms down, like a resting position. <laughs> So the maximum displacement from the resting position here, from this to the maximum point here, is known as the amplitude, amplitude, okay. So this maximum point here is what's known as a crest. So B is a crest, F is a crest, all right? Now, the dips over here are known as troughs. Troughs. So the wave is made up of crests and troughs. Okay, so a crest and then troughs. Crest and troughs. That's what the wave is made up of, series of them. Okay, so the amplitude is from the reference line to the crest. So this is going to be your amplitude. Amplitude, maximum displacement from the resting position. So that's what I have here. Amplitude is the maximum vertical displacement from the resting position, right? So in this diagram, the length O B, O to B or Y to D, And I don't have Y to D here. Okay, I'm gonna introduce that. I'm gonna write that inside. Okay, so let's call, if if, if this is O here, O here, O B, then that is the amplitude. If I put a point here, Y, let's call upon Y here. So Y to D, this is also an amplitude, All right? So these are amplitudes. Amplitude. Okay, maximum displacement from the resting position. So from here, there, like this, amplitude, and that's amplitude. So you should identify amplitudes in questions. All right. They have what called a wavelength, a wavelength. Now the wavelength is, the length of one complete cycle. Length of one complete cycle is what we call the wave length. Okay. So again, starting from this point, the wave starts goes up, down and back. So this one complete cycle, this is one complete cycle, up, down and back is one cycle. 
So the distance traveled by the wave from here, A, all the way to the point E, that is one wavelength. It's a one complete cycle. And they call this a wavelength. It's a complete cycle. I can create another wavelength. If I start from point B and then I travel all the way to the trough and then back to the peak. So crest to crest. This is also a wavelength from crest to another crest. That's a wavelength. Of course, a complete cycle. I can add a little bit here. And maybe if I complete this like that. And then this trough to another trough here. That's a trough here. If I start from the trough and I travel up, down, and back to trough, this is also a wavelength from trough to this trough. That's a wavelength. So you can identify so many wavelengths on a diagram. You know. And then the last definition that we want to look at is the word frequency. Frequency. Now, frequency is the number of cycles per second. Number of cycles per second. So if I take the time, let's say from this point to that point, let's say one second. How many cycles do I have in a second? So if I do this, I have two cycles, complete cycles. So up, down, up, down. So these are two cycles in the second, if this is one second. Then my frequency will be two cycles per second, you know, and so on. Usually the frequency measured in what's called hertz. The unit of frequency, we use the word hertz. Hertz. So this two cycles per second, right? Um, I can change this. Let's do another one. I can do one that is one, two, three, four, like a lot of cycles in one second. So this one's a higher frequency. The red one has higher frequency than the blue one. And the blue of low frequency. Then the red one will be high frequency. In other words, many cycles per second compared to that one few cycles per second. Okay. So it tells you about the speed of the wave, the speed of the wave. How fast, you know, how many cycles, complete cycles that you have. One second. Okay. Now, one of the things that you remember is the fact that when they mention frequency and hearing, think about pitch, right? Pitch. So, frequency in terms of hearing or related to the ear is related to the pitch of sound. So in a question, if you have something that has to do with pitch of sound, think of frequency. High frequency sound, low frequency sound. You know. I can do Ooh, low frequency, Ooh, high frequency, and so on. You know. Some people can sing with a very high pitch. Some people have low pitch. They're all because of different frequencies. High pitch. So high pitch means high frequency, low pitch means low frequency, and so on. So low pitch is 
low frequency. High pitch. High frequency. So remember that for hearing. Then for amplitude, amplitude, when I talk about the amplitude, the amplitude is related to the loudness of the sound. So how the size and amplitude is related to the loudness or the intensity of sound, as I've stated up there. In terms of hearing, loudness or intensity of sound. Okay, that's what it's related to. So in other words, if you have a loud sound, you have a large amplitude, loud sound means large amplitude. And low sound will mean low amplitude. Low amplitude. Okay. So that's how you can relate it to sound. Okay, this this comes up sometimes in questions. All right, so let's go here and do this exercise here. So given this wave diagram, you want to answer some few questions. So number one says, the wavelength of the wave in the diagram above is given by which letter? And then two, the amplitude of the wave in the diagram above is given by which letter? And then radio frequency, radio waves are what type of waves? So if somebody wants to answer, one of them, you can let me know. So the first one, the wave, identify the wavelength in the diagram above. If somebody wants to try. Is it A? A, correct, A. So it's from trough, sorry, from crest to crest, up, down, and back. So A is a wavelength, correct. Um, so which one will be the amplitude of the wave in this diagram? Amplitude, which letter? I'm guessing B or D. Choose one. B. <laughs> okay, let's look at B. Remember yeah, the the reference line is, this is the reference line, right? The dotted line here, the reference line. We said the maximum displacement from the reference line. So you want to change the answer? You're right, it's D. D, correct, it's D. But this one is covering two wavelengths, so two amplitudes, right? B covers from, it should, it should from here to there and then from here to there. So it's double amplitude. But the reference line is this line here. And then this is the maximum displacement for the reference line. So that is amplitude. Okay. So that's D. Okay. And then what type of wave is radio wave? It's a mechanical wave. 
Okay. No. So we have to ask ourselves, we, we can radio wave travel? Does it travel? Does it need a medium to travel through radio wave? It's mechanical, no? No? Mechanical needs a medium. Oh. But radio wave, radio wave doesn't need any medium. Right? It doesn't matter where you are, it can travel in vacuum, like space, it can transmit messages down radio waves. You don't so need electromagnetic? Yep, so that's an electromagnetic wave. Electromagnetic wave. So all those like UV light, radio waves, microwave, you know, ultraviolet light, sunlight, these are all any form of light, and radio waves. I'm Microwave. sorry, I think I confused myself because when you said radio wave, I'm thinking of that little, their actual radio. <laughs> oh yeah, yes, that, that radio, it, it doesn't need any medium. Okay. The waves that come to that radio, that's why they call it radio waves. That's why they call it radio, you know, because it uses radio waves. The antenna catches the waves, oh. you know. So it doesn't need any medium. It can travel in vacuum. If you take all the air away from wherever you are, you can still receive something. The radio will still catch the waves, you know. So that is why it's like. It's an electromagnetic wave, no medium. You don't need anything to like air to be present for, this, uh, for the wave to travel through. Light can travel through vacuum. But sound cannot travel through vacuum. So as I said, if you take all the air here, I can be speaking, you see my lips moving, but you don't hear anything because there's no nothing in between us. There should be something between medium, air, like air, to be in between us. Okay, all right. So this should be good for answering questions on this type of problems. Identifying wavelengths, amplitudes, relating frequency and amplitude to sound, loudness of sound, pitch of sound, and so on. You should be able to do those things. Okay. Okay. All right, we are almost there. We'll do a lot of math today. Then we want to look at <coughs> enzymes, a quick overview of what enzymes are. So, <coughs> Enzymes and catalysts. We need to define a catalyst first. So a catalyst represents any substance that can speed up the rate of a chemical reaction. So keywords, any one that will speed up the rate of chemical reactions, catalysts. Note, they do not take part in the reaction. Very important, they do not take part in the reaction. They are just there to speed up the reaction. Because they just speed up the reaction and they don't take part in the reaction, they remain on change at the end of the reaction. So catalysts in any reaction will remain on change at the end of the reaction. Okay. So usually when they do equations, you see the right, let's say A plus B, and then it goes all the way to maybe a product C. Then you put a catalyst here. The catalyst will put here. Maybe. So any substance that speeds a reaction is the catalyst. Okay. Now, example of catalyst will be enzymes when we come to the, um, the living organism. The living organism, then we have enzymes, okay? So enzymes are catalysts. 
enzymes. Now remember that enzymes are biological catalysts. Biological catalysts. And because of that, they do not change at the end of any reaction. All right, they just speed up metabolism within our bodies. And enzymes are protein. So these are characteristics of enzymes. Enzymes are proteins in nature. So they are proteins. And enzymes also act on substances, spe specific substances, or what we call specific substrates, okay? Substrate. Enzymes act on specific substrates. Then the other thing that they, you should also remember of enzymes is the fact that they act within what we call optimal conditions. So we need optimal temperatures. We need optimal pH ranges. In other words, every enzyme loves a particular range, narrow range of temperature and narrow range of pH. If you go outside those ranges, they, they will not function well. So optimal, best temperatures and pH ranges. Okay. And also because they are proteins, they can be denatured. In other words, you can destroy them. So they, they can be denatured or destroyed when the temperatures and pH are too high. Okay. So, so these are some properties of enzyme that you should know about. One, they are proteins. Two, they are catalysts. So the speed of reactions in the body. Three, they act within optimal conditions of pH and temperatures. Okay, and the substance on which they act on is what we call the substrate. Substrate. Okay, and they act specifically on space substrates. So there's something known as the lock and key. It's an old theory, you know, but you can think of enzyme as like a lock and a key. For every lock, there's a particular key. So it is an enzyme. The enzyme have what we call the active sites, okay, this is a protein. So let's say that I have act, what we call the active sites. Active site is where the substrate will bind. Let me draw something like this, and then I'll shape this like this. Now, wherever the ends, um, this part here, so let's say this is a ship. So this here is called the active site. Active site. The active site is where the substrate will bind. So the substrate has to have a similar shape like the active site. So whatever attaches here should be like similar. So it should be shaped maybe something like this to be able to fit in. So this will be the substrate, the substance that the enzyme will act on. It should have a similar shape, okay? So some, the name that is used here is called the lock and key mechanism, okay? It's one of the theories, okay? But there's an, a new theory that says that this is not like, just like a lock and key, but it's like not, not like a fixed shape. But what happens at the enzyme, it can open up and it can fold itself around the substrate. You know, it's got a folding mechanism. You know? So think of like wrapping, it can wrap its active sites around the substrate. If the fit is perfect, then to act on the substrate, it has to be a perfect fit, you know. That's why they look at it like a lock and key type of thing. You know, it has a perfect fit. So this goes in there, it has to be a perfect fit. So if the shape or the substrate doesn't fit the active site, it's not, the enzyme is not gonna work. That's why I say it's specific, it has to be perfect, specific. That's why I have enzymes for 
proteins, we have enzymes for lipids. You know, has to all because of different active sites. It has to fit whatever is coming in perfectly for it to act. And then for the temperature and then the um, pH, you're going to have diagrams that look like this, a graph, right? So if I have the pH here, and then the enzyme activity on this side, you're going to notice that when the, as you increase the pH, the activity will go up and then it will start dropping when the pH increases, right? All the enzymes, it, it forms this like bell-shaped curve. Now, this is the optimal pH. The best pH will be here, where you have a lot of activity, the peak activity. It's around here. So it's a narrow range, very narrow temperature. So this would be the optimal pH, the best pH. If you go outside it, if you come here, then you are destroying the protein. If you come in this region, less activity, called less activity, very low, low. Okay. The best activity will be around the optimal, around here. You know high activity, anything after that range, activity will go down. The same with temperature. If you, this temperature, you have the same type of graph. If you put temperature here, yeah. as you increase the temp temperature, the activity drops. Low temperatures, low activity. It gets to this optimal temperature around here, very narrow. You have more activity of the enzyme. Okay. That's why enzymes in our body, if you bring them outside, they're not functioning where you have to maintain the temperature, the same 37 degrees you know, Celsius, like our body temperature for them to work well. Yeah. Okay. So think about this diagram also. You know, if you see this diagram, this will represent pH and that of temperature. It's a bell curve. When the temperature is too high, they are destroying the enzyme because it's protein. It's destroying them. So activity goes down. Okay. Too low, you're freezing the protein, it's not going to work well. It has the best temperature. Okay. Right. Then one more diagram I'm going to add here, and then I'll stop on this. You can also have the enzyme activity and then the substrate. The substrate concentration. Yeah, the substrate concentration like this. Now, at the beginning, when you start act, putting in the substrate. You notice that the enzyme activity will keep increasing, 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 increasing. Now it gets to a point where the reaction will not increase again. It's going to become stable. Like it, it tapers off like this, and then before it, it starts going down. OK. So when it gets to this point here, then you reach a maximum amount of substrate that the enzyme can take here. If you do not by chemistry, they talk about something called Vmax. Vmax, which you don't need for this test, um, just the maximum capacity that the enzyme can arrive at. Okay. Because when you start initially, there are so many active sites of the enzyme. So let's say that you have active sites, active sites. Okay. So the beginning, if we put a substrate in, it's going to fit in here. So it's going to break it down, put it more in, more substrates. It binds to more active sites. So the more active sites it binds to, 
then the reaction increases and increases and increases. Now, when all the active sites are occupied, so you occupy all the active site, then the reaction is going to slow down. This you've been stable for some time. And then keep adding more, the reaction will not increase. Okay. That's the explanation for this type of graph. Okay. Occupation of the active sites. It's like you have more seats available. So you keep putting more people in. They have more seats. They come in their seats until the, it can saturate it. All the seats are, seats are taken up. If all the seats are taken up, then everything slows down you know, until some seats are you know, unoccupied. People leave and other people come in. You know, type of thing. It can stable. People leave, someone comes in, leave and come in. It's like a stabilized reaction. So this is what enzymes do. Okay. Uh, I believe that's a good point to stop on the enzymes. Okay. Um, any questions on this? Two more topics for today on the science, and I think I would have covered all the important things I need to do for science. Any questions? Enzymes. Okay. All right, great. If you have no questions, then let's look at the gas laws, the gas laws. So back to more chemistry. Now, the gas law. I believe most of you have already seen this in your chemistry classes. Learn about this somewhere in your chemistry classes. There are laws that govern the way gases behave. And one of them is known as the Bohr's law. Bohr's law. Okay. Now, Bohr's law states that at a constant temperature, so here, look at the constant temperature. Temperature is constant. If the temperature is constant, it says that the pressure of the gas varies inversely as its volume. Okay, so that's what we call Bohr's law. Bohr's law. So it says that at a constant temperature, the volume of a gas varies inversely, so the keyword is inversely, as the pressure. Okay, that's Bohr's law. Okay. <clears throat> what does this mean? Inverse relationship. Inverse relation means that as the temperature, as one property goes up, the other one decreases, right? So in math, it's gonna look like this. You have pressure and volume down, negative, like a negative slope type of thing. So as you increase the volume, the pressure is going down. Now down, 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 when you increase the pressure. If you increase the volume, pressure goes down. If you increase the pressure, the volume is going down. Okay. Inverse, which is so to summarize, I always put it this way. If you increase pressure, the volume goes down, volume down. That's one relationship. If pressure goes down, decrease pressure, the volume would increase, volume goes up. Inverse relationship. Okay. So what is an example of this? An example of this would be for you to think about if I have, let's say, 
a certain amount of gas in a container. Let's uh, start with this. And that's a, like a piston and plunger, right? Let me, like, see if I have something in a con container with a piston here. Yeah. And it's a volume of a certain amount of gas. So there's a volume. If I increase the pressure here, let's say P is initial pressure. Let's call it P1, I call it V1. If I increase the pressure, that means I push this plunger down. So here the pressure has increased. Look at the volume, the volume here, V has gone down. Okay, it has gone down. Increase pressure, decrease volume, inverse relationship. Now when it comes to our body, the human organism, you should be able to relate this also to some scenarios. One scenario would be like respiration. Think about the external respiration. It follows Bell's law. For me to take in air, let's think about this scenario. Now, I'm gonna take in air to breathe in. What do you notice? You notice that your, your, for you to take in the air, the rib cage moves outward, right? So it moves outward. What happens to the diaphragm? The diaphragm goes down. So what happens to the volume of the chest cavity? You read the chest cavity has increased. So there's increased volume of the thoracic cavity. Because of the increased volume, the pressure of the thoracic cavity goes down, right? So pressure is decreased within. Now the atmospheric pressure is now higher. The pressure outside does the air, it's higher, atmospheric pressure. So what's gonna happen is that the gas is pushed in, oxygen rushes in, because you have a low pressure inside you than outside. So the air is forced in, into the thoracic cavity. All right, so that's egg guessing. So that is, Boss law, decrease volume, increase volume, decrease pressure inside. Higher pressure outside pushes the gas in. If you want to breathe out, what happens to the thoracic cavity? You see that the rib cage moves down, right? Now the diaphragm moves up. So the volume of the thoracic cavity decreases. Because the volume is down, the pressure is high, the pressure goes up within the thoracic cavity. Now the pressure is higher than that on the, or the pressure outside. The atmospheric pressure is now lower than in, inside the cavity. So the gas is pushed out from high pressure to a low pressure. That's how you breathe out. Okay, so that relationship or scenario is all about Bohr's law, okay, Bohr's law. Okay, and then mathematically, we write the um, boss law as like this. So boss law, it's what we have here, P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2. Okay, that's the mathematical form, uh, formula for calculating different pressures and so on. If I know the initial pressure, P1 is initial pressure, V1 initial volume, P2 final, V2 final volumes. If I know these numbers, I can calculate, let's if I know three of them, I can calculate any missing option. So that's a formula for Bohr's law, okay. At least for those doing detailed chemistry. No, but for this test, you should be able to relate it to a scenarios, the different scenarios that you come across. Okay, these are some examples that I'm giving. 
the respiration. So here the temperature is constant. The temperature is constant. Okay. So in the question, you should identify the fact that there's a constant temperature somewhere. There are some experiments that we'll look at in the book. When we go through the book, we'll see some um, other experiments where they, they apply this same concept, Bohr's law. But they won't tell you that the temperature is constant. You have to figure it out from the experiments and use it. Now, the second one is Charles Law. Charles Law. So Charles Law, he says that at a constant pressure, so here the pressure is going to be constant when we talk about Charles Law. Constant pressure. So let me get rid of this here. And then we'll look at the Charles Law. Okay, so Charles Law. All right, so Charles Law says that at a constant pressure, so here the pressure is constant, the volume of a gas varies, this time the word is directly, as the temperature. All right, so the key word here, we have a direct variation. Direct variation. What do we mean by direct variation in math? Direct variation means that if I take the two quantities, so here we're looking at volume and temperature. As the temperature increases, the volume increases. As the volume increases, temperature increases. Okay. So the change is in the same direction. They both increase. If they are decreasing, they both decrease. Okay. So if we, if, if increase temperature, temperature up, then volume will also be up. And then second scenario, if the temperature goes down, T down, B will also be down. Okay. Same change. The direction of change is the same. So that's the direct variation. Okay. And here the temperature, the pressure is constant. We talk about a constant pressure. So at the constant pressure, as volume increases, the temperature increases. And the opposite is also true. Okay. And mathematically, this is a relationship. B1 over T1, in final initial temperature, volume over initial temperature should be equal to final volume over final temperature, V2 over T2. So that's the mathematical relationship right there. Okay. All right. So what is the scenario here? Think about the balloon. filled with some form of gas. What happens if the temperature goes up? If the temperature goes up, then we expect this balloon to expand, increase in volume. So temperature up, volume goes up. If the volume drops, if the temperature drops, what happens? Then the balloon will get smaller. If the volume will go down. That's a relationship. So that is Charles' law.
Then the other one is known as Gay-Lussac's law. Gay-Lussac. Now, Gay-Lussac's law says that at a constant pressure, at a constant volume, this time you look at constant volume, at a constant volume, the volume of a gas varies directly as the temperature. So that's Gay-Lussac. It's almost like the Charles, but this time the, temp the, the volume is constant. And then you look at the other, relation, other relation, uh, quantities. Gay-Lussac's law. So at a constant volume, constant volume, the pressure of a gas varies directly as the temperature. Okay. In other words, when the volume is constant, if you increase the temperature, the pressure will go up. If you decrease temperature, the pressure goes down. The okay, same direction of, in direction of change. Like, so if the graph again will look like there's like a negative, so like a positive slope type of thing, temperature and pressure. Okay, so as temperature increases, pressure is increasing. Temperature increases, pressure is increasing. If it goes down, it goes down. So you can think about this in terms of, let's say, the um, one second here. All right. Okay, so think about the the car tire. Oh no, no, not the car tire. Um, let's say if you're boiling water, let's say have water. and I cover the pan like this. All right, if I, if I warm up this water, what's gonna happen? You're gonna realize that initially, as the temperature increases, the water escapes into the gas phase, right? So we have more molecules of gas in here more molecules get to a gas phase. So you see that the lead will be pushed up, right? It ends up being pushed up by the, by the gas. So temperature up, the pressure is increasing. Because we've covered it, the volume here is fixed. Then we have a fixed volume of air here. We've covered, it's discovered, it's sealed. So if you increase the temperature, the pressure would increase. That's why the lead ends up being moved up. You know. So that's a way to think about Gay-Lussac's law. Constant volume, pressure up, temperature is up, temperature down, pressure down. Okay. All right. So those are three main 
laws that you should be thinking about for questions. Uh, the other ones, combined gas law is a combination of all the laws. It gives you what they call a combined law put all together. You get P1, V1 over T1 is equal to P2, V2 over T2. You know, all the laws put together. Okay. And they have something called the ideal gas law. Ideal gas law. I mean, there's no ideal gas, but this represents what's called ideal gas law. The gases come to close to ideal, but they are not. All right, so the three main laws know that very well, and there's different scenarios that I've given to help you answer questions. All right. Any questions? Any questions here? Questions, questions. Okay, right, we're making good progress. The last topic I want to look at and then we'll answer questions is this last one here, which is radioactive substances and have life. Radioactive substances and have life. Radioactive substance, what are they? Okay. Let's talk about radioactivity. Radioactivity is a random process that happens naturally as the isotopes in a particular, in particular elements decay. The isotopes continue to break down over time, right? And the length of time that it's taken for half of the nuclei in an element to decay is called the half life, half life. Okay, so some key words here is the word decay. Okay, when I say decay, it means that to break down, when you use the word decay, it means that you have the element with a nucleus and some elements which are called the radioactive elements, they can break down, the nucleus can break down. Okay, so when nucleus splits up into different uh, smaller pieces, we call that radioactive, um, referred to that as decay. So decay is breaking down or splitting up. Okay. And the time taken for half of the substance to break down or to decay is what we call the half life. So you're gonna come across half life a lot. Half life. In chemistry, sometimes they write, the, or, or physics, they'll see write T, and then they'll write like half like this, T half. That, that's what we call half life, okay. So it's time for half of the substance to break down, of the element, the nucleus to break down, the time taken. I'm highlighting that, half life. Now, what does this mean and how do you use it? I'll give you one typical example. Now let's begin with this substance. Now, now, before I look at the example, let me let me give you one isotope here. You know, carbon, there are two types of carbon, right? You have carbon 12 and carbon 14. 
Okay. These are isotopes of each other. We spoke about isotopes some time ago. Okay. They're isotopes of each other, right? Because they have the same number of protons or the same atomic numbers, but the mass numbers are different. In other words, they differ in the number of neutrons, right? Now, carbon-14, this one, is a radioactive substance. So that's a radioactive element. So this carbon-14 can break down, the nucleus can break down you know, over time. And that's what it is used to do the, what we call the carbon dating. See, so carbon dating is used in archeology, span a lot in archeology. span Right, to measure, I'm um, to determine the years of objects. You know, if they measure, because if you have a living organism, there's a certain amount of carb, uh, carbon 14. Now, if the living organism dies, then the carbon 14 begins to decay, to break down. So if you know the amount that is left in a dead organism, you measure the amount that of carbon 14, you can calculate and find how many years that object has been there, you know because you know the amount in the living organism. So if I know the amount in the dead organism, once I do the calculation, I can say, oh, this is thousand years old or million years old, you know, and so on. That's what they do with the carbon dating. Measure carbon-14 that is left in the substance. So the example that I'm talking about is this. Let's say that you start with a substance and the substance is 100 grams of substance. Okay, that's your starting point. You know, they give a question like that. You start with something, they give the mass. Then they give the half-life. So let's say that they tell me that the half-life of this substance, half-life of this substance may be, I'll make it like five years half-life of, let's say, five years. Okay. Then they'll ask you a question like, how long, of oh, sorry, how much of this substance will be left after, uh, let's make it about 15 years. How much of this will be left after 15 years? All right. So this question, we can use basic arithmetic to do it. You know, if you're doing chemistry, then you're going to use logs and other things, but you can use basic math. So I'm going to work for 15 years, right? So I start with 100, then I'm going to do this. So the first five years, half level five. So first five years, ask yourself how much of this will be left. Half life means half of the substance will be left. So the first five years, it means I'll have. 50 grams left of this left, first half. Another five years. It means every five years, half of will be left. Half of this will be left. So I have 25 grams left. Another half life, another five years. Half of this will be left. So I have 12.5 grams left. I want 15 years, to say after 15 years, right? So this is one half life. So that's one, two, and three. All this make up the 15. Right, so there are three half lives that I use here to get my final answer. So I end up with 2.5 grams at the end of 15 years. You know, so that's how you can use this approach to answer questions. If you know that T half break down the substance, every half T half half of the substance will be left. Every T half half of the substance will be left till you get what you want. If you say 10 years, then we will just stop two half lives right here, 25 and so on. 
that's, that's the arithmetic approach you can use for questions like this. Okay. And we're gonna see questions in the book soon. Now, the other way they ask the question is to work backwards. They work backwards. They can give you um, the end product, let's say after 15 years, you have 12.5 grams of a substance or a radioactive substance left. What is the half-life? What's the half-life? So in that case, you try to work backwards. You try to work backwards. So if I end, you start with like 12.5 grams and then multiply by two going backwards, 25, multiply again, you know, and then you calculate how many half-lives that you have. If it takes 10 years to get to 50, they're going to split that by two, by five, and so on, you know, depending on what you've been given. You can play around with this setup the way I have it to answer questions. So that's T half approach to answer questions. Now, the other thing you have to know are the radioactive, uh, what we call the type of decay. When a radioactive substance break down, they release particles. And those particles are known as the radioactive particles or the, um, yep. So the particles that are, re re uh, are released in radioactive decay, we, one of them is alpha decay, alpha, alpha particle. We have what we call the alpha particle. So types of radioactive decay. So the first type is known the alpha decay. So that's alpha like this particle. Some substance release alpha particle. Now the alpha particle is basically a helium. That's what you have here. Uh, it's basically a helium atom, right? They have four and two, atomic number of two, and then the mass of four. So it's basically a helium. It's helium. So you see, you see H, E, two, four, that's helium. Okay. And that's what the alpha particle is a helium atom. Okay. So this is an a typical equation, you know, X is the element, A is the atomic mass, Z is the atomic number, all right? So if they give you something like this, the question they ask you basically is easy to work them out, okay? So like what I have here, I'm gonna make up a question here. Let's I have an element, let's call it X, atomic number of maybe, Let's put a simple number here, like 25. Let me make up something. I'm just making up something here. And then let's say this is, let me put this like four, four, five, six. I'll let me make it 10. And then I draw an arrow. This breaks down into another element. Let's call it B. And they tell you that this releases an alpha particle. So an alpha particle, so it means the helium atom like this, okay. or you can just use the alpha particle here, alpha symbol, okay. Then this will be missing. Let's put A here and maybe C here. They ask you find A and C. The value of A and C. Okay. Now to do this, you have to compare 
the number of atom the atomic numbers on both sides of the equation, the atomic masses, right? So look at atomic masses. You have 10 here. Now talking about you have 10 here, C and two. It means what should C be in order for you to get 10 on both sides? Okay, that's what that means. Okay. So in other words, you are looking at 10 is equal to C plus two. You know, that's what you're looking at. So it means that your C should be equal to eight, right? So C is eight. Okay, we can have equations like this. Now, what about A? A, you're gonna compare the atomic masses, this and that. So it means that 25 is equal to A plus four. So what is A? A will be 21. So A is equal to 21 and so on. Okay, so that's how you can use this scenario to answer questions. Okay, they tell you, the, they give the formula, the equation like this, and then ask you to find some missing parts of it. Compare the atomic numbers, compare the masses on both sides. Okay. All right. Now the other particle that you come across is the beta, beta particle. The beta particle. So the beta particle, like Greek alphabet beta, like this. All right, so basically the beta particle is like an electron. It's an electron that is released, so it's like an electron. So it's sometimes they write E and a negative one, zero. Or as they have it here, you can write it like that too. Okay. Okay. So you see that they know that that substance released a beta particle. Okay. So like I did for this one, you can have something similar. Okay, that's what they're trying to show you here. You can do something similar. Okay. Then the other one is called a gamma particle. Gamma particle. Gamma particle. Now the gamma particle is basically a neutron that is released. Okay, so it's gamma, Greek alphabet gamma like this. So it's a neutron that's released. So sometimes they're gonna write this as NO00 like this, or using the gamma symbol, no charge, no, no atomic number. Okay. Zero charge and zero mass here. Okay. So we see that like as they have here, That means this has released a gamma particle and so on. Okay. Um, the other ones, they are just like combination of that one. So here, electron capture. Here, it means the electron is captured, is being captured here. I'm not going to talk about that. But if it's on this side, it means it's been added on, captured. If it's on the left side, if, it's, if on the right side, it means released. On the right side, means it's capturing, you know. And then you have something called a positron. A positron is like a positively charged particle with that does, does not have any mass. It's called a positron. But the common ones you should remember is alpha, beta, gamma radiations. 
type of, is according to the type of radiations. We can add that here, radioactive or types of radiations. Good. Then one more thing to add to this, and then that'll be a good point to stop. You should know about types of nuclear reactions. Types of nuclear reactions. One of them is known as fission, and two, the other one is known as fusion. Okay, fission and fusion. Nuclear fission. Fission means you splitting up, splitting up the nucleus. Okay, so a, a representation of that would be like this. You have a big atom that you are breaking down into smaller pieces, smaller particles like this. So a big A going to A, B, C, you know, something like that. And then the, the particles are given off, right? So are splitting. Then the fusion, fusion means you are joining, joining of nuclei. You put two, two nucleus, nuclei together, two nuclei together, you are joining. Okay, so the reaction is, look, is gonna look like having maybe B plus C giving you, let's say A, a bigger, Nuclei, so that's fusion. Okay, fusion. Right. So nuclear fission. These are used to generate a lot of electricity. You can use to generate electricity, you know, energy. Um, and then, but some also use it for bad things too. You know, like the atomic bomb it was nuclear fission. They end up splitting the small at the uh, atom of the nucleus of their hydrogen. And then it, it releases a lot of energy, you know, that causes a lot of damage. So those are two types of nuclear reactions that I want to highlight here. Sometimes they give you an equation, they ask you to identify what type of nuclear reaction you see. All right, so that should be enough for radioactive substances for this test. Does anybody have any questions to ask on this? And I'll talk on the last topic. All right, so these are our examples here. Examples of radioactive decay. All right, so here I have a little bit more of the properties for the various um, types of radiations, right? So alpha radiation, if they are not, the energy is not as high as the other ones. You can use paper to stop the radiation, just to protect yourself, you can even use paper. Paper will stop alpha, alpha radiations, right? Now, beta radiations have higher energy than alpha. To stop them, we can use thin metal sheets like aluminum. Thin metal sheets, aluminum to stop them. Then gamma rays, gamma, ray, uh, gamma rays have higher energy than the alpha and beta, and you can only stop them using like a thick lead or steel plates. It can be used to stop them, lead and steel plates, thick one. You know, just like. X-rays, X-rays, you need thick lead or steel plates to stop them. Whilst the neutron, what we call the neutron rays, the neutron rays, you can stop neutron rays using like water or concrete to stop them, right? So they are classified based on their energy levels of 
penetration, the degree to which they can penetrate substances. And I says, these are examples, real life examples of radioactive decay. Uranium, uranium, if you leave it, it breaks down into thorium and then you release an alpha particle, okay? So they can give you the equation like this one, and then you have to find the numbers here, okay? You should to identify the numbers here they give you this. One is missing, like I did. Now this example of spontaneous fission, where you're fission, splitting. So you have this atom splitting into these different ones, smaller atoms, and then it releases a neutron. All right, so these are some of the things you think about. Right. All right, and then this will be the last topic on this paper. Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about light, light and its properties. Now, light can be reflected. Okay, we represent the light by means of rays, light rays. So what we have here called the light rays, the red light rays. So when it shine light on a mirror, it can be reflected. So the first property is reflection of light. Reflection of light. Now this light that you shine here, the ray is called the incident ray. And then once you hit the mirror, it's reflected from the surface in the opposite direction, right? So it's coming in here and then reflected towards and reflect away from the mirror. Now this ray here is known as reflected ray. So the person has the eye here, you see the light coming out. And uh, so that's a reflected ray. If I draw a line perpendicular to the surface of the mirror, this line is called a normal. So the normal line is perpendicular to the surface of the mirror. It's called normal. So that's a normal. Yeah, perpendicular to the surface. So this 90 degrees here. Okay. Anytime draw a line perpendicular to the surface for that's a normal. Now the angle between the normal and the incident ray is what we call the incident angle, that's I. So this is the incident angle. I for the incident angle here, I. And then the angle between the normal and the reflected ray is called the angle of reflection, and that is R. Okay. What are the properties that you have to know here? The property is that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. They are equal. So that's what I have here. I is equal to R, always. Angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection. It's very important to remember that. Okay. So that it will give a question where this is a mirror, incident ray, reflected ray. And they draw a normal here, and they tell that this is 30 degrees. What will be the angle of reflection? It's also going to be 30. You have to select 30 in the answer, 30 degrees. Okay. I believe we'll see a question like that in the book. <laughs> yeah, the same. So that's reflection. Then we have diffraction of light, diffraction. Light can be diffracted. What do you mean by diffraction? 
This is defined as the bending of light waves around obstacles in its path. Bending of light rays. Light travels a straight line, right? But it can bend a little bit if it encounters a small object. It can bend a little bit around it. So the light is traveling, hits the object. It can go through the object, but they can bend a little bit around the object. And that's what we call diffraction of light. Bending of light waves around obstacles in this path. And this is how we can see the bacteria on the slide, right? Five microscope, and you have a slide bacteria on here. The light shines on it. It doesn't go to the bacteria, right? It bends around it. And then you have your objective lens here that you can see. So that's how the microscope works. You know? So the bacteria will appear like dark dots on the, on, on the um, slide. Bacteria, they appear as dark dots. That's what you see on the slide. And with a halo of light around it. So these are bacteria, there's a little light, a halo of light around it. Okay, that's how you identify bacteria on the slide because of bending, slight bending of light around the particle. Okay, so as I have an example here. So, as what when the light wave passes through a barrier with a small opening, it acts as a single point source from where light emerges and spreads in all directions, right? So, this also explains when you have. Let's say I have a small hole somewhere here and then I shine light. Or I have any form of wave coming in here. Or let's say even water, right? You see that it goes, you see the ripples like that. You know, go to here, it spreads out, it bends a little bit, spreads out a little bit. little bit of like bends a little bit. The, the whole acts like a small object. So that is diffraction of light. And then we have refraction of light, refraction. So refraction of light comes in when you have, you have let's say a coin in the bottom of a pond or like this fish here, you know. Now, even though the fish is original one is here, it appears as if it's closer to the surface, you know. It deceives your eye as if it's close to the surface, whilst it's a little deep. It's all because of the bending of light as it travels from a more dense medium to a less dense medium or a dense medium to a less dense medium, you know, the light has to travel through mediums of different densities for you to have refraction, okay? So instead of the light going from here, going all the way straight like that, there's a little bending towards, a little bending, you know, and that's what's called refraction. So it appears as if the object is coming from this point here. So normally, if you draw a, a normal here, I can, I can draw a normal at this point, normal to the surface here. Draw a normal to the surface. If I draw that normal, then you see that this ray is bending away from the normal. Okay, it's bending away from the normal here. Okay, now what does this mean? When light rays move away from the normal, it means that it is speeding up. It's speeding up when it moves away from the normal. When it's close to a normal, it means it's slowing down. So here you have a water here, which is dense. It has a higher density. Density higher. That's the water, 
and then here air. You have air around here. So air has a lower density for the air. Okay. So as the light travels from the water and coming to the air, you see that it's speeding up. It's moving away from the normal. So it's speeding up. That's why it moves away from the normal and that's caused the bending of the light. Okay. And the object appears closer to the surface. Okay. In the lab, it's gonna look like this. In the lab, you usually have a glass block that looks like that. And then I'll draw a normal here and then normal, normal here. So this is a glass block. Glass block. So if I shine line and I have air around it, right, air. So light, shine light here. As it, part, it goes through the, from the air into the glass block, it ends up bending a little bit in a block. So bends a little bit. If I draw another normal on this side, as it comes out, it's gonna move away. So this can be done in the lab. Okay, have your eye on this side, put light source here, and then look at it from the other side. Okay. So this is a normal. This is another normal here. Okay. Now this light ray here is known as the incident ray. So this is gonna be the incident ray. The light that comes out here will be the emergent ray because it's coming out. So emergent ray. And then what we have in the middle, in, within the glass block, this is going to be the refracted ray. Got a refracted ray. OK. Now, the angle between the normal and the incident ray, this angle here, let's call it I. So this I is going to be the angle of incidence. Okay. Now, let's put R here. R here, angle between the refracted ray and the normal. This is called the angle of refraction. So this is the angle of refraction. Okay. Remember these are parallel lines. The normal is parallel to that because it's perpendicular to the surface. So normal, yeah, these are parallel. So the normals are parallel. It means that this is a transversal from math. All right, that's transversal. The refracted ray is gonna be a transversal. That means that the angle between the refracted ray and the normal at this point, this is all going to be R. So this is also R. It's going to be R. And then as it merges, this is going to be your I. Okay. So as it merges, we're going to call this the emergent angle or angle of emergence. Angle of emergence. Okay. So the angle of emergence will be the same as your angle of incident outside there. Yeah. Now this takes us to what we call refract uh, something called the refractive index. Refractive index of a material. Okay. Now, what is the refractive index? Every material has its own 
uh, refractive index. And there's somebody's name that's associated with the word refractive index. That person's name is Snelling. It's called Snelling. Okay. So we have what we call a Snelling's law, right? So the refractive index measures the amount of light that an object can bend. And every material has a different refractive index. So we take water, water has its own refractive index. If we take wood, you know, a glass, for example, they all have different um, refractive index. So this is how you measure the refractive index. This is equal to, you take a sign of the angle of incidence to that of the um, angle of refraction. So sine I to sine R. If you do this, then you get the, what we call the refractive index. Every material will give a different figure. You know, so let's say if I have diamond, I can use, you can measure the refractive index of the diamond. Someone brings you something, tells you this diamond. You shine light, measure refractive index, and then you, you compare to the normal diamond. If the two values are different, then when the person is giving you a fake diamond, you know. So they measure the refractive index, how much light can pass through and it bends the bend degree of bending. And as I said, the person who worked on this, his name is Snelling. So if we come up Snelling's law, this is what it is about. So, so there's a question in the book that says that to, um, to determine this, to, um, to de define the refractive index of a substance, which are the following will you use? or to apply the Snellis law, which are the following sources that will you use? Then they, they have some like ruler, will you need? They have like ruler, protractor, micrometer, and some other things. You know, so which are the following will you need? So in that case, you need a protractor. You need a protractor because you're gonna measure angles, you know. So I have some, values here. For the um, let's see here. Yeah. Okay, refractive index for air is one point is about one, right? And then that's for water is 1.33. And then glass 1.4. Diamond is 2.4. One knife. You know, these are some values. Okay. And then the last piece we're gonna look at here is what we call dispersion. Dispersion of light. Dispersion of light. Okay. So dispersion of light means splitting light it's into its component colors. You know, we have something called a white light. White light, if you pass the, this white light through a glass prism, it comes out with all the different colors, the rainbow colors, the spectrum. Okay. So that's what we call dispersion, splitting light into its component colors, splitting white light into its components.
All right, so that's a rainbow colors. So Roy G Vive. So that's a mnemonic that you can use to remember the rainbow colors. Like think of somebody's name, Roy G Vive. So it's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, right? As you can see here. Is that a rainbow colors? Right, Jim Bive. Okay. So I believe that brings us to the end of what I want to talk about today, and that is science. You know. So three, four properties of light: reflection, refraction, diffraction, and dispersion. All right. So take note of those definitions. All right, great. Any questions before we move to the book? Okay. All right, so I believe so far so good, right? Okay, so let's go to the book and then practice some few questions and I will take a um, few minutes break and come back and do our math. So we're gonna spend a chunk, whatever time is left to do math so we can catch up a lot. So let's go to the book. So now that we've covered a lot, we should to tackle a lot of problems. Next week, we'll still do more review of problems. Yeah. So we're gonna go back to our science section. I'll start with science one and look for problems related to what you've done so far. Okay, look at page 219. Page 219. Number seven. It says, as light passes obliquely from air to water, it is bent. This bending is called A, diffraction, B, reflection, C, refraction, and D, dispersion. So what do you think? C. C, correct, refraction, all right. Because it's passing from less, like a dense, less dense to a dense medium. The ones that are different densities, the bending is a fraction, correct. Page 220. Page 220. Number 16. Two two zero number sixteen. It says, as the eardrum is made to vibrate more rapidly, the sound is perceived as a louder in intensity, b softer in intensity, c higher in pitch, and d lower in pitch. C. C. You said C, correct? Yes. Yeah, that's okay, that's correct, C. So it's vibrating rapidly, rapid vibration. That means that the frequency is high, more cycles per second. So remember, I said high frequency, it means high pitch sound. You know, frequency goes with pitch. Amplitude will go with loudness of sound, right? So, so here, pitch, high pitch. Great. Okay. Um, let's see this one here. Let's go. Page 227. 
page 227. Now you have um, 227, number 52. It says that in humans, if the diaphragm is pushed upward, there is a decrease in chest volume. This decrease is followed by, and then A says, an increase in pressure in the chest cavity and inhalation. B an increase in pressure in the chest cavity and exhalation. C, a decrease in pressure in the chest cavity and inhalation. And D, a decrease in pressure in the chest cavity and exhalation. So the diaphragm is pushed up, upward. And there's a decrease in the chest volume. So what do you think happens to pressure, up or down? Volume down, what happens to pressure? Yes, anybody. <laughs> If the volume pressure goes increases? Down. Yeah, the pressure increases, right? So volume down, pressure goes up. That's Ball's law. Ball's law here. So pressure, volume down, pressure up. So the pressure has increased. So if the pressure increases, what's going to happen? The thoracic pressure is now higher. So what happens? You're going to push out the air. You're going to push out the air. So here you're going to exhale, you know. So that's that's how it be B, increased pressure, and there will be exhalation followed by exhalation. Push the air out because the pressure is higher than the atmospheric pressure. Okay. Good. Okay, let's see another question. Page two thirty. Page two thirty. So page 230, that one, it's a diagram that looks like what I have here like this. It's a wave. And then you have, this is A. Then they gave us B this and then this is D and C. So the question says that which of the arrows in the following graph represents the wavelength of a wave shown of the wave shown. So when the wavelength so A B C D which one is the wavelength? B. B, correct. So B is a wavelength. It's a complete cycle. Crest to crest. Correct. Okay. Let's go to page 239, page 239. So that's a diagram. So the diagram, again, it's like, it's in a diagram, a ray of light travels from air to glass. So we have air like this, and then travels to glass. 
So the question says, which of these measuring instruments is needed to find the index of refraction of the glass? And I have A, ruler, B, protractor, C, balance, and D, thermometer. B, protractor? Yeah, protractor. So you have to measure the angles. The so angles. because I measure angles, you need a protractor, correct. Number 43. 43. Many chemical reactions occur more rapidly with platinum as catalyst. At the end of the reaction, the platinum is found to be A, increase in quantity, B, on change in weight, C, change into another state, D, combined into the final product. B, on change in weight? Yes, on change in weight, right? So we'll talk about the properties of an enzyme. Or no, no, BG is a catalyst, right? Just a catalyst. Enzyme are within the body, but catalyst. When you talk about catalyst, like anything that speeds up the rate of chemical reaction and remains unchanged. So once it's within the body, then we call it an enzyme. All right. So it remains unchanged. That's correct. Okay, page 240. Page 240, that's where you have the food chain question. So as I said, the answers are within the question. You don't have to think outside the box here. Think about the question. So let's look at 48. 250. See. So the question says, what it says, the correct order of a food chain represented in this diagram is, you want a correct order of a food chain. So what you have, you have grass, C. Okay, you got the answer, C. Okay. So let's say grass, rodents, owls, vegetables here, yeah. to rabbits, to snakes and then vegetables go to rodents. Rodent goes to snake here. Rabbit go to owls and then have hawk. Snakes to hawk. Okay, so that, this is how it looks like, right? And he said, answer is C, grass, rodent, snake, hawk. So let's see, grass to rodent, it goes to snake and goes to hawk, correct. You just have to follow the arrow. So C is correct, the correct order. Then 49 says, a necessary member of the ecosystem not represented in this food web is A, producer, B, primary consumer, C, decomposer, and D, secondary consumer. So a member that's not represented. The decomposers? Yeah, decomposers. So decomposers are not shown here. So C. And then 50 says, if vegetables are removed from this food web, which of these results will be the most probable? So you're taking away vegetables. And the answer of A, the snake population would increase. B, the rodent population would die out. C, the grass would increase. And then D, the rabbit population would decrease. D. D, the rabbit population would decrease. Okay, 
squared. So if you take a vertebral, so we're saying that this is out, vertebral's out, the rabbits have only, they only get their food from the vertebrals, only one source. So if this is out, that means that this is going to go down, decrease, all right. All right. So you see, that's how you answer the question. You don't have to have too much insight into what the problem is about. Just have to look at a diagram. That, and then if you know the de definition of the terms and the ecology, you can apply them. Okay. Great. Look at number 53. Number 53. So that's a radioactive isotope. Say how many, how much of a 12 gram of a radioactive isotope with a half life of 20 years will be left after 40 years, after 40 years. So try that and see. Is it B, three grams? Three grams, okay. All right, let's check if your answer is correct. We'll check and see. So you're starting with 12 grams, right? That's a, and it's a T half of 20, T half of 20. So it means first 20 years, half of this will be left, which is six grams. Another 20 years, three grams, Will be half of this will be left is three grams. So 2020, this makes up the 40 years. So you are right, correct. Excellent. So you can just use arithmetic to do a problem like this. Okay. Great. Let's see if more problems. Page 248, number 36, 37, 38. <laughs> So that's a food pyramid, food pyramid. Is it D? Okay, so you have uh, green plants, right? Green plants here, insects, birds and snakes. Okay. Um, and so what, 36 is what, what first, if any, result would you expect if a decrease, a disease decreases the population of snakes? Uh, okay. You said what, well, the birds will increase. Yeah, you're right. So it's a note, A says no change will occur. B, the number of birds, the number of green plants will increase. C, the number of insects would increase. And indeed, the number of birds will increase. Right, you are right. Because if a snake population goes down, so you don't have snakes here, so it means that the bird's population would increase. Perfect. 37, which are herbivores? A, green plants, B, insects, C, birds, and D, snakes. They want herbivores. So yeah, definition for herbivores. They feed on plants. A, green plants. Oh, wait, herbivores. Oh, please. Which one are you choosing? B. B, yeah, correct. B. B they, they feed on, so the insects are feeding on the green plants, right? So, insects. Insects. 
So B. And then 38, according to this pyramid, to support 100 pounds of birds, which of the following is needed? Which of the following is needed? A, more than 100 pounds of insects. B, more than 100 pounds of snakes. C, less than 100 pounds of green plants. And D, 100 pounds of insects. So you want to support A. birds. Okay, so you need more than 100 pounds of insects. Correct, so you need more. Whatever is below, you need more of that. So that's, so um, A is correct. More than 100 pounds of insects. The birds feed on the insects here. So you need more than that, 100 pounds. Okay, correct. So you see how you can get a lot of points just by using the diagram, look at the diagrams and then knowing the, the definitions to use. Okay. You can score a lot of points. Okay, I think number 42 is something that we did today. So 42, a mixture such as mayonnaise is best described as A, a substance, B, saturated, C, a solution, and D, an emulsion. D? D, yeah, that's an example of emulsion. Example of emulsion, good. Okay, number 44, you may know it or you may not know it, but you make a good guess. You may have heard it somewhere. A woman standing at the bus stop hears the siren of an approaching ambulance. As the ambulance passes by her, she observes a shift in the frequency of the siren. The effect she heard is known as the A, photoelectric effect, B, Doppler effect, C, phase shift effect, and D, Einstein effect. Make a good guess if you don't know the answer. Doppler effect. Correct. It's known as a Doppler effect in physics. Doppler effect. Okay. So as ambulance moves away from you, it appears as a sound is moving away from you. If it comes close to you, you see it appears louder and so on. You know, that's called Doppler effect. Okay. All right. Make a good guess for number 45. The pitch of a vibrating string depends on all of the following, except the pitch of a vibrating string, okay? So a question like this, your mind should go to the guitar, right? Think of the guitar. That can help you come up with the answer. Make some of the things practical. Okay? String vibrating like a guitar string. A, the length of the string. B, the amplitude of the vibration. C, the thickness of the string and of the string. And then D, the fre uh, frequency of the vibration. What do you think the pitch will depend on? Good guess and el good eliminations. Who's gonna make a guess? Is it the length? Hey. No. Try again. I guess C. Try again. Now you have two options left. One more try. D. D or B? D. Okay, the answer should be B. It looks tricky, right? <laughs> the answer should be B. Okay, we said one, one, think of it's amplitude and frequency. Pitch is related to frequency, all right? As we said. So we can do a quick elimination by thinking of frequency, pitch, amplitude. They are different. Right, do different things right here. Okay, now the so pitch will go with the frequency, right? In, in this question, pitch and frequency, so they're related. Okay. Then the thickness. Think of the guitar. 
you know, they always change it. It has, it has different thicknesses. So they produce a different pitch. If you look at the guitar strings, different thicknesses. Now the length, the length, you vary the length by tightening. When you tighten it, stretching, and you know, you're varying the length when you tighten it. So that is changing the length of the string, right? So the length, the thickness, and the frequency, they are all related to a pitch here. Amplitude is not related to pitch, right? Amplitude does go with pitch. Yes, yeah, so that, that's out of this question. It's an exception here. So B. And so, so sometimes use all the different ideas that you have, you know, to make elimination if you don't like know the particular answer for that question. Okay, good. All right, page 250. Page 250. Number 47. It says that as the angle of incidence of a ray of light striking a mirror increases, the angle of reflection will A, increase, B, decrease, C, remain the same, D, first increase, then remain constant. So you're increasing the angle of, incid uh, the in angle of incidence as it strikes a mirror. What is going to happen to the angle of reflection? Remain the same. Right. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, go ahead, 1%. I had somebody saying A. I did. Yeah, the answer should be A. It's going to increase, right? So remember, we said the third degree. I use the 30 degrees as an example 30, 30, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, the incident to 40, the angle of reflection will also be 40. If I increase to 50, it's going to be 50 and so on. So if it increases, it's also going to increase. You know. So to keep increasing and increasing until you're going to get to what you call the critical value. Okay, what is this? Let's look at this one here. Okay, uh, so the answer is A. Okay, let's try number 48. The idea that new varieties of organisms are evolving today is best supported by the A, increasing need for new antibodies. Diminishing size of the ozone layer. C, cl climate changes resulting in global warming. And D, increasing size of human population. The idea that new varieties of organisms are evolving today is best supported by D, A, increasing need for new antibiotics. B, diminishing size of ozone layer. C, climate changes resulting in global warming. And D, increasing size of the human population. Can I guess A? Yes, yeah, A, correct. Increasing need for new antibiotics. Yeah. It, like the way you have the, um, the COVID cases that what do you call it, the coronavirus? Yes. New, that's very similar. So there's like question re related to that. New varieties 
coming up. So there's a new a need for like you know having new um, vaccine and so on. So a uh, forty nine. It says, in a food chain, an organism that feeds on green plants is known as, it's now that the, the different aspects, A, decomposes, B, producer, C, first order consumer, and then D, second order consumer. It says feeding on plants. C? C, correct. So it's the first order consumer, the first to feed on the producer. Okay, great. Okay. So at least I believe I'll be able to stimulate you a little bit to think about problems. Um, if you look at page 252, it's, it's again something about the light rays that we just studied, right? In the diagram form. They put in a diagram form. So look at a diagram and they say, which of the rays in this diagram best represents the reflected ray? Best represent the reflected ray. D. Uh, B or, no, B or no. D? B, B as in boy. Yeah, B as in boy, yeah. B as in boy, that's correct. Okay, so it's, that's a reflected ray. Cause it's 30, 30. That's what it said, but it should be reflected. You know, that one is going through, so it can, and that one is, for the mirror, the, the, the ray cannot go through it. So it has to reflect on the surface. Hit the mirror, travels in the back, backwards, in opposite direction. So B is correct. Okay. All right, just one question here. Number 58, the elements. So sometimes you know the symbols for the elements. It's good to know the symbol that, especially this, the ones that don't match the first letters, you know, like potassium, sodium, and you should know some of them too, you know. Um, but here, which or the it says which of the following elements is a non-metal? It's a non-metal. So you have to know some metals and non-metals in the periodic table. Those on the left side, the cutoff will be like carbon. If you take carbon as a cutoff, go four. Anything to the left of carbon, those are metals. Those to the right of carbon, they are all non-metals. So which one do you think is a non-metal here? Sodium, mercury, sulfur, manganese. Non-metal. Uh, which one? Is it A? Uh, sodium is in group one to the left of carbon, so it's a metal. All the group one are metals. So if you look at a periodic table, you see that's on the towards the, the first group. So those are metals. Another tray. Mm -hmm. Sulfur? Uh, sulfur, yes. Sulfur, correct. Okay, so sulfur, that's not, sorry, it's not a non metal. So manganese is a metal, mercury is a liquid metal. You call it like a liquid metal. And then sodium are all metals. Okay, yeah, so sulfur, correct. Okay. I'll make a guess for number 59. 
machines can be used for all the following purposes except to A, multiply force, B, increase energy, C, transform energy and multiply, and D, multiply speed. Can be used for all except. Make a good guess. A. Okay, okay, machines, they can multiply force. Something that you cannot do with your energy, so it's like a machine can do it for you. So it, it can multiply, increase the force to do something. B. All right, the actual, the, the actual answer here is B. B. It doesn't increase the energy. It conserves the energy. Whatever energy you put in, it conserves the energy. You know, it can multiply the speed. It can transform the energy. But it doesn't increase the energy. It is called a law of conservation of energy. It preserves whatever energy is put in, this is maintained. You know, but it can multiply the force. The same energy I put in can multiply the force that is being used to do the work. So machines make work easy. So the exception here is that it has not increased energy. Whatever we put in input will be the same as the output energy. All right, great. Um, let me see if we have one or two more and then we'll switch. Okay, let's see if test number. Okay, page 290. 290, number four. Two ninety number four. So, which of these diagrams correctly shows a water wave passing through a small opening in a barrier? So, water wave passing through a small opening. So, a. Is it a? Um, is it B? B, correct. B is correct. When they, we have, so we cannot have water if it's a hole, it cannot come up straight, straight, straight like that. You know. So B is correct. If this is an opening, you have the water coming, the waves, it goes like a ripple, you have a ripple, it spreads out, you know, diffraction, most of like that. Okay. And then C, we can have that. This and no, D is even worse. <laughs> it's like, all right, so it's B, perfect. Okay, let's see one more here. Okay, let's look at number five. Let's do five, six, seven. Number five. Which of these conditions most likely explains the sudden death of many fish in a river on a hot day in summer? A, an increased number of predators. B, an increased growth of algae. C, a reduced food supply. D, a reduced amount of dissolved oxygen. A. A. You said what increase? Um, okay, let's try again. Mm -hmm. we, we, the question says the key words here says, so which of these conditions most likely explain the sudden death of fish in a river on a hot day? Right, the key word is hot day in summer. So if you have a hot D. day, what is going to happen to yeah, D? Right, you're going to have the 
you have a reduced amount of dissolved oxygen, okay? High temperature reduces how much oxygen will be dissolved in water, okay? The ox oxygen escapes from the water when it is heated up. Okay. So the, the fish will have less oxygen to survive. So D, appropriate. Then number six, the energy associated with an object's motion is called A, its potential energy. B, nuclear energy, C, kinetic energy, and D, thermal energy. So energy associated with motion, an object moving. We did this under mechanics. What do you call that? Mm -hmm. C, kinetic energy, correct. Kinetic energy, but energy due to motion. Energy due to position, that's what we call potential energy. Potential energy. Okay, but here it's moving, so it has kinetic energy. All right, number seven. Number seven, I just spoke about that today. It's so in the reaction, now they gave you 2H2O2, and then they put MnO2 here, 2H2O, and the question says, the catalyst is A, H2O2, B, MnO2, C, H2O, and D, O2. Which one is the catalyst? B, the MnO2. Correct, yep. So you see when I drew the other diagram, I put a catalyst there. So this is a catalyst, MnO2, that's the catalyst. Correct. Number eight, the frequency of a sound is directly related to its A, loudness, B, pitch, C, timber, and then <coughs> D, resonance. Pitch. All right, frequency goes with pitch. So if you see that question, just remember me. Frequency, pitch. Amplitude, loudness of the sound. Okay. That's how you can apply them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, making good progress. Okay, so again, page 291. <laughs> 291, related to the gas laws. So you see all different scenarios, but the same thing. If you know what you're dealing with, you can answer the questions easily. And number 12 on page 291. <laughs> it says, when the rib cage moves upward and outward, and the diaphragm flattens out, A, air is expelled from the lungs. B, air is drawn into the lungs. C, air pressure in the lungs rises. D, there is no charge in the air, sorry, there's no change in the air pressure in the lungs. So the rib cage moves up and outward. The diaphragm flattens out. So what happens the volume here? C. All right, you said C. All right, so the volume has increased in the, in the thoracic cavity. Right, increase volume. If the volume goes up, the pressure is gonna go down. Volume up, pressure down, Ball's law. So what happens? The atmospheric pressure is now higher 
than the thoracic pressure. So gas will have to rush in, oxygen will have to go in. Okay, so the answer should be B. Air is drawn into the lung because the pressure inside is low. Inverse relationship between volume and pressure. That's what it's been you have been tested on. Ball's law. So this is the second scenario that we've seen in the questions. Application of Ball's law. Okay. Um, number 15. Number 15. The first living thing found colonizing a hitherto barren area is called A, producer, B, primary consumer, C, pioneer organism, and D, carnivore. So the first living thing that's colonizing a barren area. I'm guessing. Yeah, make a good guess. First, the keyword is first. A. Try again. Look at the keyword, first living thing. B. <laughs> Try again. <laughs> I wanted to make a good guess, a good one. First. Oh, I get it. It's C, the pioneer. Yeah, it's pioneer. First person to, you know, to discover something, right? First. So the first living thing. You know, so what, what I'm trying to drive at is you don't have to know everything in, you know, like certain things you may not even cover. But then if you look at the words, you can make it a good deduction, you know, this is tricky. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so the keyword is first living thing. So first your mind should go oh, pioneer protein. Because you know producers. If the other ones are common to you, you know, producer produces like the, uh, uh, what do you call it? They make their own food. Primary consumer, we, we, we dealt with that. It, it feeds on the producer. Carnivore feeds on other animals. So if you look at this, all these things, you can make good elim elimination. The only one that is odd here is the pioneer organism, okay? Which again, related to the uh, pioneer means first. So when you see questions and you're not sure, just you know, do a little elimination technique based on what you know, you know, get rid of things that you know first. Okay. All right, then number 16, look at number 16. Also on the ecology. Now, if you go through the definitions that I said you should look at, that I sent to you, you see all these definitions there. Ecological succession and other things, they are on that paper. Yeah. So number 16, page 292, it says, photographs in an old family album reveal that an area now covered with shrubs and small trees, which occasionally gets swampy in the spring, once was a pond. This is an example of A, a food chain, B, ecological succession, C, an ecosystem, and D, colonization of barren land. Again, try and make a good guess by eliminating. D. D. No. <laughs> try again. Is either B or D? I don't know. Okay, B. Okay. B is correct if you just B. All right, so again, elimination technique. Now that it says, think of, um, say first of all, shrub, right? Now it used to be like, um, it used to be a, a pond, it was once a pond, right? Then you have shrubs that took over. Guess Swamp in Spring was once a pond. Okay, so like you have a pond and then suddenly something came to take over. Think of the word succession. You know, succession, something comes and that one takes over, you know, succeed, succession. You know, take over something. So that's called ecological succession. It's taken over by another type of organ organisms or, gen you know, ecological succession. 
Great. All right, so I believe I, we've seen a number of problems to stimulate you to, you know, look at more problems as you go on. All right, so I want to stop um, here for today on the science so that we can spend a little more time on the math today. Um, as I said, next week will be more, more we, since we've covered all the topics that we need to do, to just be questions. We we'll go through more questions. So we'll do that exam. And then you, it will, I mean, like the one that, the way I do it, I give you, you the answers will come up. Once you submit, you get the, the, the immediate response. And then we'll discuss areas that you have having uh, difficulty on or you don't understand. Once we finish, we'll answer more questions. We'll go through the book, any other questions that we see, we we'll just answer them that we've gone down so far. All right, so that's what we do next week. Questions, 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 and practice. Okay. All right. We're going to move on to the math, um, but let's take it's 12.49. 12.49. So, okay, so let's look at some of these questions that you just done. So, number six. So which of the following fractions has the highest value? Which of the following has the highest value? So which one did you choose? C. Which one? C. You said C? I answered C. That was my guess. All right, let's see what you did. How did you do it? Let's see if you're right or wrong. So this is what one over five times Three, that's 15, right? So one over 15 here. This one is one over eight. This is one over, this is two, this is three. Right? So it's one over two. And then this is one divided by five divided by three. So if you work this out here, this looks like one over five over three. That's what that means. So if you're dividing two fractions, you keep the top fraction times reciprocal of the fraction the denominator. So it's three over five. So this is three over five. So it means that this here is three over five. That's what this is. Okay. So one way to compare the fractions is to change to decimals. You know, they can compare, compare them. You can compare using decimals. Okay, so change to decimal and then compare. Now, another way, usually I can, I like to examine the fractions. It, you know, it's a quick way to look at the fractions. So I'm going to compare, look at my thinking process. Just see, I'm going to compare, think in a quick way without going through all the fraction decimals. I know that one half, is half of the denominator, correct? Anything that's half of the denominator is one half. So if I compare one over 15 to one half, all right, I'm going to compare one half to one over 15. Which one is bigger? Obviously, one half is bigger than that, right? So the, because halfway through 15 is seven. If I have 7.5, over 15, that's half, it's equal to half, then it will be the same, All right? So since this is less than 7.5, it means that this is smaller than the one half. So that's out. One over eight, what would be, what was equivalent of one half? Half of eight, so if I have four out of eight, it's half of eight. All right, so if I compare four out of eight to one half, uh, sorry, so if I can compare one over eight to one half, this is, the one is less than half of the eight. So in, in other words, it's not one half. So it means that one eight is also smaller than one half. So this is also out. Now I'm gonna compare one half to the three over five. 
what will be half of, and what's this equivalent here? Half of five is 2.5. So if I have 2.5 out of five, right? That will give me exactly as one half. So it'll be the same, this and that will be the same. But now what do I have? I have three out of five. So it means if I have three out of five, it's bigger than this 2.5. So it's, it's more than half. It's way, way more than half. So it means that this number 3.5 is bigger than the one half. So this is smaller than that. So obviously the answer that I want is three over five. So you can do comparison of the fractions like this quickly. Is it half, half, half? Other than that, you just have to use your calculator to find the decimals and compare the decimals. Okay. okay. All right. Okay, number seven. What's the average weight loss per runner? A group of 25 runners recorded a total weight loss of two to five pounds after completing a marathon. What is average weight loss per runner? So you want to find the average weight loss. D. D. Okay, let's see. So you have, what, what do you do? Um. Because to get the average, you need to get the numbers divided by the total of the runners. All right. And then so, the total, yeah. which is the 225. So I divided the 20 to 25, 25, 25 divided by 25. Yes. And then you got nine, correct. So nine pounds, that's correct. So average weight loss. The weight loss divided by total number of people. Okay, then number eight, we're changing the minutes to seconds. Minutes to seconds. Professor, please, I have a question. Yes, please. Yeah, the question seven mm -hmm. should be 10 because when you add 225 plus 25, you get 225, 250. And then 250 divided by 225 should give you 10. I don't know if, yeah. No, I said that, I said that, that one, the 25 represents the number of runners. Okay, okay. Yeah, not like the weight. Okay. Yeah, I said that you had a group of 25 runners and then the total weight loss is 25, I thought 225, right? So the question yeah. is every weight loss. One way you can look at this is think about, as somebody is driving, if you can mute yourself, like, thank you. All right, so the way you can look at this is that what was the average weight loss per person? So average, so weight loss, you want a weight loss, divide per person means divided, right? By a person, number of people, number of persons. That's what that means. Okay. So the total weight is this, and then the number of people is 25. You got it? Yes, thank you. You're welcome, okay. All right, so number eight. eight. Three. Yeah, go ahead, please. Sorry, I thought you were asking for the answer. My yeah, 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 go ahead. Mm -hmm. Answer is A. A, 200 seconds, okay. Can you tell us how you did it so that we can all understand? I mean, there are different ways of doing this problem. So I them, did it by, so the three over one third, three, I automatically know that's three minutes. So th there's 60 seconds per minute. So okay, let me write down, as, as you're talking, I'm gonna write it down. That's okay. a, good, a quick approach too. So it said three okay. minutes, you have three minutes. So you change that to seconds, right? Yes, I change it automatically to seconds so that's 60 seconds times 60 three. times three okay three times 60 yes. which is 180 180 correct. and then one, one third, third of the minutes yes one third of the 60 seconds Good. one third of 60 is 20 20 and they added them together yes correct excellent perfect 
you know. I mean, I'll do that too, you know. One third of 60 as 20 and then three minutes that, okay. The other way an eye person can approach this, some people will change this to improper fraction, improper fraction. So they'll do this improper. So let me say method two. So improper fraction, that'll be three times three is nine plus one. So it's 10 over three. All right, then they multiply by, since 60 seconds equals one minute, they'll multiply by 60 and then get the same answer. Three here is one. Three here is 20, 200 seconds. You get the same answer. So use the, the method you feel comfortable using, you know. Okay, number nine, that should be straightforward for us. When you're changing to percentage, you multiply by 100, right? Multiply by 100. If you're multiplying by 100, you move the decimal points two places to the right, okay? Percentages, you're multiplying, whatever is fraction given to you by 100 or decimal given to you by 100, they have a percentage. Okay. So what answer do you get here? Eight. Yeah, 18%, uh, correct. 18%. Okay. Got two, 18 out of 100, okay, that's what that means. Two decimal places, which is 18%, uh, correct. All right, so, so some questions, you're gonna move fast. You know, that some questions will take your time. So always pace yourself. Okay, now that you've learned a lot, you have to start pacing yourself. When, when you're doing the exercises, time yourself. And I keep saying, practice with timing, you know, so that your brain will get used to the time. When, you know, some people only time themselves when it's exam time, that's the only time they get to time themselves. You gotta practice with timing now. So your brain can, get used to it. So when you're working a question, your brain knows, oh no, I've spent one, one second, two seconds, three seconds on it. Automatically, you know, you'll be, your brain will be working like that and you'll be able to speed up. The same with if you're reading comprehension. You know, put a little time on yourself. When you're reading something, see how fast you can read and then read again, improve the reading by timing yourself and speeding up, you know. The brain learns like that. Practice, practice, practice. Then the time will not beat you. Okay, number 10. Number 10. That one should be able to do that easily. Yeah. Anybody has a question, number 10? I believe you all be fine with number 10, correct? So that we can do more problems. I get confused with this part. Okay. So this one the decimal the decimal points. Okay, let, let's look at that. If you're using the calculator, then there'll be no problem, right? So but if without calculator, then we have to do it. Okay, so for this one, you can write it as 3.45 divided by 0 0.15. Put it in this format. It's gonna help you. Now, when you're dividing decimals, right? You always make sure the denominator, there's no decimal in the denominator. That's the key, look at the denominator. Make sure there's no de decimal. Okay. So here, you're gonna multiply by 100. In other words, move the decimal point two places to the right. So I'm gonna go from here one, two to the right. You know that I'm multiplying by 100, that's what that means. So now this denominator becomes 15. Whatever you do to the denominator, do the same thing to the numerator. Since I move two places, I have to move this also one, two. So the decimal is now at this end. So it's a whole number now, this is, three, four, five. Then you can divide these two numbers using a long division, okay? If you're using a calculator, then at least you have no problem doing this problem, okay? But without it, you have to go the longer way. So 15 into 
345. Then you have to divide. So 15 to 345, that's two times. So it's two, two times 15, that's 30. Subtract, you have four, bring down the five. 15 divided into 45. So that'll be three. Multiply, you have 45. Subtract, nothing left. So the answer will be 23. 23. So that'll give us D as an answer. D. I hope it helps out. Is it better now? Yes. Okay. Um, I just want to add um, for everyone who's going to be taking the NLN, I think we're not allowed to use our own calculator. Yeah. They're, they're making us um, no paper as well. I think they only allowed um, like the erasable whiteboard. So the way that the professor is doing it is like, I guess the best way to practice. Like um, without the calculator. Without, yeah, I mean, yeah, because I mean, it helps you. And especially if you go into your, then some of the nursing classes, you got to do some of these things without calculator too. You know, the nurse medication, they, yeah. they, they test you on these basic things, you know, so it's good to get a hold. You know, some people, just because they can't pass the um, medication class, they end up dropping, they drop down to the courses. Some people find it difficult passing that particular one. You know, there's a math aspect. Yeah, yeah. I was so kind of like laying, relying on the calculator because I know you're gonna have to answer in a like strict time. Mm -hmm. But then when I was reading through the whole instruction of the NLN, they're not allowing you to use calculator. So I'm like, eh, should I pay attention to when he was? Because I remember in like previous classes, you're like, go ahead with the calculator, but you like to to calculate it like this way, like the like. The old-fashioned way, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, the, the manual way. I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah. I mean, you, you say, well, if you practice the hard way, then if you're allowed to use calculator, it becomes easier. Faster, yes. <laughs> faster, yeah. It's supposed to help Yes, you. it's true. So I'm kind of <laughs> like... There's some, just... problems, there's some problems. There's some problems. The calculator, you don't even need calculator. You, you can just... Calculator will waste your time. You know? Yes. So <laughs> just want to give everyone a so... heads up. Yeah. Because I'm like, you know, oh, my goodness, no calculator. So now I'm like practicing math now without calculator. Exactly. <laughs> so. <laughs> and then we don't even think through the problem. Because, because some people use a calculator and they get answer. Go, this answer. No. Sometimes it's even you're, you're punching the wrong thing. And <laughs> your yes. mind is telling you that's the correct thing. I just want to no. share that to everyone because I'm like, oh no, no calculator. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> like kind of practice math now without the calculator. Yeah, so this is good, you know, we showed it a little, little hard way and then the easy way you have a calculator easy. Uh, good. All right, so that's number 10, right? At least you know how to do decimal. Move, make the denominator a whole number first. Whatever you do, a denominator, do the same to the numerator, and then you can divide. Okay. All right, so number 11. Okay, number 11. That one says the price of a certain medication is 8.50 per bottle. If the price increases by 7%, how much will a bottle of medication cost? So we've seen some problems like this already. But the math is going to be like repetition of the things we've done. So it will help you remember more. So that's the original cost. You're doing 7% increase. B. OK, you got B. I think that's correct. <laughs> OK, so help us out the way you did it. Oh, so for 8.5, I multiplied it by 0 0.07 because I converted the percentage to a decimal. Okay, let me write that down. They can continue so we are all on the same line. So 8.50, she found 7% of this first. So yes. she worked with decimal. Remember, for those who have forgotten, 7% the same as 7 out of 100. 
So if you change to decimal, two des you move the decimal, you are divided by 100. So the decimal point should move towards the left. Okay. It's like the decimal point is here, then you move it into one, two, two places to the left. So that means I have to add zero. So 0 0.07, correct. So 0 0.07, seven out of 100. Okay. And then what did you get? I got um, 0 0.595. 0.595. Okay, so that's about 60 cents. Yes, and then I added that because they're asking for the increase, like how much would it be the increases? Okay. So 7% converted into, I mean, 0.95, no, 0.595. I added that to the 850. Okay, and that's so how I ended up with nine. The 60 cents plus that, and they have 910, correct dollars correct okay so problems like this find the percentage increase the percent of the increase then what do you get you add it on some questions will say percentage like decrease let's say somebody bought something they said decrease or, or just another word we mark down the markdown rates they mark something down then you subtract you know but they, they, they're similar you do the same process percent first of the original and then add it on if it's increase. Subtract if it has a decrease. Okay, that's that's a concept that you should remember. Okay, great. And these questions will come up again, you know. So know how to do percentage increase problems or decrease problems. All right, number twelve. Number twelve again. That's long division. And then you have to round to three decimal places. Long division and three decimal places. Number 12, 367 divided by 35. <laughs> so long division. So you have to do 35 into 367. All right, so let's see, 35 into 36, that will be one. So three times one, so 35 times one is 35. Subtract, six minus that is one. Bring down the seven, so you have 17. 35 into 17, impossible, so you have to bring zero. Introduce a decimal point, then you can, we can, you can keep adding zeros now. Okay, so anytime you introduce a decimal point, you can add zero. Now 35 into 170. So 35 into 170, how many times? Let's say four times that will be what? 35 times four, four, that's 20, 140. So 140, okay, so that'll be four times. 35 times four is 140, subtract, that's 30. I can add zero since I've already introduced my points. And then divide again, 35 into um, 300. So 35 into 300, let's try eight and see, you know. So if you go to the answers, you can you can look at the answers and, for, and and make a good estimate of the numbers that you use. You need, you know. I see eight there somewhere. I can try that. But the four zero, it's not it's not going to be zero here. So let's try the eight. So thirty five times eight. Let's see, eight five. That's forty. Four left. Twenty four. So two eighty. Okay. So it should be eight. So that's two eighty. Subtract. 20, I can add zero and divide again. This is going to be about four here, that's 40, another, so that's about seven. It's going to be around seven because 35, that's 70 here, okay. So about seven. So seven times 35, is it going to be seven? That's seven times 35. 
No, no, that's where we are above. So six. Six. Six times five is 30. Three left. Three times six is 18. 18 plus two, so that's 200. Six, 30, 18. No, no, this we were above, not 200. Six times five is 33 left. So that, that goes above it. Okay, so this should be five. It should be five. Five times five is 25. Five times three is 15 plus three plus two. So that'll be 175. 175. Subtract. This is five. Nine left here. This is two. And I can add another zero. Divide again. So if you divide, it should be around seven, I guess. Or well, this seven times, let's try seven. Seven times five is 35. Three left, seven times three is 21 plus three. So that's 24, so that's correct. So we can stop here. We want three decimal places. So you have to work till the fourth and then we're gonna round up. So we're gonna run this number here. So go to the right, this is more than five. So more than five, we're gonna make it one and add the one, so plus one, increase this by one. So the answer will be zero, 10.486. Okay, that will be the answer for this question. Without a calculator. Okay. So rounding must be mastered, how to round. Numbers. Okay, number 13. Let's go 13. So to allow tape recorders in class, school policy states that two thirds of students in that class must request to use a tape recorder. So two thirds must request. As you read problems, always summarize what you're reading. So two thirds, if, if, you, if you have it's a paper and pencil, then you can circle important keywords, you know. So two thirds must request. You have to request. I say if 15 students out of 48 have requested to use the tip, so 15, out of 24, so 48 have requested. So 15 out of, have requested to use the tape recorder. How many more must do so before the tape recorders will be allowed in class? So you want to find how many more. That's the summary. Okay, so try that and let's and let me see how you do it. How many more must request? Any ideas how to approach this problem? Okay. 
It's like a two-step problem. So the first, you have to find two thirds of the 48, okay? You have to find a number that need to request. So the number needed to request will be two thirds of 48. That's the amount of people you need. Two thirds must request. So what's two thirds of 48? Two over three times 48. Okay. We can put this over one if you want to make any mistake. And I can reduce to lowest terms. Three into itself is one. Three into 48 is one, six, 16. That means that we need 32 people to request, 32. But we have 15 people already request, who have requested out of 48. So the question is how many more must request? So those more so number needed is thirty two minus the fifteen, and that will be seventeen. So you need 17 more. Okay. Any question on this one? So it's a two-step problem. It's almost like a percentage problem that we did. Certain percent of this number. So it's two thirds of the total needed. All right, it is no question, try number 14. So at the start of a diet, Mr. Smith weighed 184 pounds. So it starts. And then eight days later, he weighed 170. Nine pounds, one seventy nine. Eight days later, and the question says, "What was his average weight loss?" You want to find the average weight loss. Per day. Okay. So what should we do in this case? Average weight loss. I guess first you would just subtract the 184 and the 179 to get five pounds loss. Okay. At a, at a, Right, five pounds loss. And then you divide by, because weight loss per day, right? So we divide by number of days, it's over eight days, right? So the average weight loss will be five divided by eight. Like a, mm -hmm. one. No, don't go too far. Look at the answer. You go an extra mile. So it's five over eight. That's what you want. Pounds per day. Oh, okay. Yeah, the answer is in fractions. So yes, stop there. All right, thank you. Good. So that's number 14. 
All right, number 15. Number 15 is almost like number 13, it's a similar concept. The amount of iron recommended for a typical adult woman is 18 milligrams. So 18 milligrams daily. And I say one woman's average diet contains only 75%. So the person diet contains only 75% of the recommended. Dose. So a recommended daily amount. Say so how many more milligram of iron should her daily diet contain to supply the recommended daily amount? B. You got B. Okay, let's see. So 4.5, all right. Tell us what you did and let's see if we can get a same answer. <laughs> I made a guess. So um, the 18, I grabbed the 75% of the 18 milligrams. Okay, so 75% so. of 18 milligrams, correct? That's the first step. So you're finding it's 75% of this, what the person is getting now. So 0 0.75 times 18. And what did you get? Um, I did 13.5. Okay, 13.5 milligrams. So that's what the person is getting now. Yes. Right. But the recommended is 18, right? So I did I subtracted the effort. 18. I mean the 13.5 to the 18, which Correct. I ended up with the 4.5. Correct. Excellent. So it that was a, it, it wasn't a guess, you did the right thing. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. All right, so first 15, 75% of the recommended, they know how much the person is getting. Now, how many more? When, when you hear the word, how much more? How many more? There should be some subtraction that should come to your mind, All right? So you subtract like this, correct, good job. Okay, then number 16 will be fast. So some questions will be fast. So you save time on the fast questions. Remember properties of exponents. We discussed that last time. So now this should be a quick one. You're multiplying eight, eight to the power three times five, eight to the power four. Is it A? A, correct. So you multiply out the numbers, A times five, which is 40. And then for the A, you are A to the power three times A to the power four. Remember the product rule. Product rule, what do you do? You add the exponents. So keep the base, add the exponents. Okay, seven, so A to the power seven, correct. So 40, A to the power seven. Add up the exponent in multiplication. For a similar, the basis should be similar before you can add the exponents. Okay, so A is correct, perfect. Okay, 17. 17, proportion, proportion, proportion. Of the children coming into a clinic, 7.5% have a certain condition. For every 150 children who visit the clinic, how many are expected to have this condition? So you can set up a proportion. Seven point five, uh, seven out of 100. The yeah, 7.5 represent those with the condition those who have the condition. And here the number of people. Number of people here. So we set up your proportion, you still have condition here and have the number of people here. If you match them like this, you never go wrong. 
now we have 150 children. So let me just put away children instead of people here. Number of children. So I have 150 children, so that'll be here. So how many people had a condition? We don't know. So we use a variable. They have a proportion, X over 150 is equal to 7.5 over 100. Then do your cross product. X times 10, sorry, X times 100, that's 100 X, 7.5 times 150. And divide by 100, divide by 100, okay. You can make your life easy. You can reduce zeros. You can cross zeros out, cross zero out. I can reduce the 15 and then that, or if I like, I can multiply and then divide by, by 10. It's easy to divide by 10. Okay. You just have to move this more point when you're dividing by 10. So I can keep it like this and then just divide by 10. Okay. So I multiply the numerator. 15 times 7.5. First, without a calculator, that means that I have to forget about the decimal points and multiply the numbers and then count the decimal places. So this seven times 15 times that would be what? 25, two left, 75. Seven five is 35, three left, three, seven times one is seven plus three, 105. So five, this will be two, one, one. I have one as my place, so I'll move it one time here. So it means that the answer that I have here is 112.5 divided by 10. If I'm divided by 10, it's easy. I move the decimal point to the left. So if I move this one place to the left, it becomes 11.25. Okay, so this is the number of people I expect. But this are dealing with people, we cannot have half a fraction. The decimal represents a fraction of something. So we can have point something. So it means that I expect to have like 11 children. <clears throat> so the answer will be D. Sorry, it will be C, 11 C. Okay. So proportion, shouldn't forget proportion. Okay. Now, please try number 18. I know those are the type of questions that you also like as medicine students. Medication problems. A patient is given three tablets, 250 milligrams each. Three tablets, each one is 250 milligrams. And the person is giving this for five days. Give it for five days. And the question says, how many grams of the medication was a patient given? So we want to find the total number of grams. Question mark, grams. <clears throat> So try that and give me the answer. Once we finish, you can tell us what you did.
Can I give it a go? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Oh, so there's three tablets of 250 in a day. So what I did was I multiplied um, the 250 into 250 three. times three, correct? So I ended up with 750. 750 milligrams, correct? So it was given five days, so I multiplied it by five. All right. I ended up with 3,750. I don't memorize this on top of my head, but I think 100 milligram is equals to one gram. So I kind of like- It's, it's thousand. Oh, is it thousand? I don't know. So, yeah, so thousand- <laughs> So I changed my answer to B. Milligrams is one gram. So let's write that somewhere so we can remember. Okay, so now you're changing the milligram to? I'm changing the milligram to grams. grams. Okay. So my answer is B. Initially, my right. answer was C, but it's B now. Okay, <laughs> so you have to divide, right? Because yes. gram is like a bigger unit. So moving from big to small, uh, a small unit to a big unit. So you have to divide to get a smaller number. So divide is by 1,000 and then three places to the left, one, to first, so it's 3.750 grams. 3.75. So that would be B. So B. So 1,000 milligrams, one gram. That's the key over here. So they're testing to see if you can remember that. All right, so number 19, 20, those are quick, quick ones. If you look at them, you see they're quick problems. Like number 19, it's a quick question. Which of the following decimals is most closely related to, more closely equivalent to five or seven? Five or seven. So you have to do a long division. Seven divided by, this divided into, into five. Seven into five. So seven into five here is zero, impossible. So you introduce a decimal point, write zero, add zero to the number. Then you can divide seven to 50, that'll be seven times, <clears throat> multiply, but to nine, subtract one. Add zero again, seven to 10 is one time. Seven times one is seven. Subtract, that is 30, three, add zero. So you have 30, seven to 30, that's gonna be um, three is 21, four. Four is 28. So it keeps going like this. You want two decimal places. So you just have to stop at the third one. This is less than four is less than um, five. So you can neglect it. So the answer will be just 0 0.71, two decimal places. So that would be C, you're gonna be C here. So, long division. If you're allowed to use a calculator, then that's easier. Punch in five and divide by seven. Okay, so number 20, Testing you again on fractions, testing on fractions. So say a recipe requires one one fourth cups of non fat. A person already has one third cup, how much more needed? So the key word is how much more. You have one fourth cups and already have one third. As you need one one fourth. Say so how much more, key word how much more. So we see how much more, then she tell that you have to subtract somewhere. Okay. 
So it means that you have to do one, one fourth minus one third, taking out this from one, one fourth. So they're testing you on subtraction of fractions. How can we do this? Let's review this one more time. When you're working fractions and you're subtracting LCD, you should have a common denominator. So between four and three, the LCD will be 12. So you're gonna ask yourself what was done to the four to get 12, this is times three. Whatever it's a denominator, do the same to a numerator. So three times one, so this would be three. Three to 12, this is times four. So I have to multiply numerator also by four. So one times four, four. Now, if I subtract the fractions, I'll get a negative number, which is not good. I can borrow from a whole number here, so I don't need to have a negative. So three minus four is not gonna work out for us here. So let's borrow from the whole number. So I'm gonna borrow one from the whole number. Now, the one that I'm borrowing, remember it's in terms of what? It's in terms of the denominator. The denominator determine the parts. So if I take 12 out of 12 parts, that is one. 12 out of 12. So if I, one, if I take one, it's 12 out of 12 parts. I'm taking all the 12 parts. So I'm gonna add the 12 parts to the three. So I end up with 15 parts out of the 12 parts. The whole number is gone because I, I borrowed it. And then minus four over 12. Now I can subtract. 15 minus four, that is 11 over 12. So this is the fraction that is left. This 11 over 12 cups. Yeah. So that's a borrowing approach, which we did some time ago. So just recap that one more time. It's gonna come up again and again and again on as we go through problems. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so 21, say so which of the following values equals 0 0.35 times 10 to the power four? Okay, that's another one that you can also do quickly. So will somebody give us an answer by looking at it? You look at the exponents. The exponent is positive four. If the exponent is positive, you move the decimal point to the right. If the exponent is negative, you move the decimal point to the left. B. B. Okay, let's see. You have, yeah, you are right. So we have positive four here. So that means that you're multiplying by, um, you have to move the decimal point four times to the right. Okay, so it's gonna go one, two, three, four. So it means I have to hold the place values with zeros. So it's three, five, zero, zero, correct. Okay, perfect. Twenty. Two. 22 is multiplication of fractions. Multiplication of fractions. So if you can do it and take us through, I'll be glad. Let me hear from you. So what would be the first thing to do?
you have to change this to improper fraction first. So improper fraction. So three, eight times three is 24, 24 plus three, 24 plus three, that's 27. So 27 over eight times two one third. Two one third is going to be two times three, which is six plus one. So seven over three. And then you, you try to reduce the lowest terms if it's possible. Three into itself is one, three into 27 will be nine. Nothing more to reduce, so you multiply horizontally. Nine times seven, that will be 63, divided by eight times one, which is eight. And then you change back to the mixed number. So changing back, you have to divide 63 eight into the 63. Okay, so that means that this would be eight into that, that would be seven times, seven here, so that was seven. Eight times seven, that's 56. Subtract, so that would be seven, right? So this is a remainder, right? So the answer here will be seven whole number. So seven whole numbers, then remainder seven out of eight. So that'll be the answer that you're looking for. Okay. All right. Any questions so far? Professor, I actually have a question, but uh, I can I can ask after I mean after we're done. On this on this one? Not for this question, it's different question. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, when you finish. Okay. All right. So number 23. Say so one tablet of children's aspirin contains one one fourth grain of aspirin. So one tablet. contains one one fourth. Grain is an old measurement. Okay, one tablet, a grain. And say so an adult aspirin contains five grams, five grains, five grains. So the adult one, so the child, this is a child. Then the adult one, they said it's five grains. Say so how many children's aspirin will contain the same amount of medication as two adult aspirins, aspirin tablets. So say so how many of children will contain the same amount as two? So here you are looking at two adult tablets. How many of the children amount can you get here? Three. 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 children tab. Say that again. I'm what guessing B, eight. You said eight, right? Yes. Okay, let's do it together and see. So we need to find two, two adult tablets will be two times five, right? So that gives us 10 grains of the adults. And we told that each child tablet is one one fourth. So it means that we have to break down this 10 into one one fourth parts, all right? So then we have to divide. So it's 10 divided by one one fourth to find how many tablets to get. So since you are dividing, change to improper fraction, one fourth will be four, five, that's five over four, five over four. Yes. So now we're going to reciprocal of the second fraction and then multiply. So it's four over five. Five into itself is one, five into 10 is two. So we have two times four and that'll be eight. So correct, you're right. So eight tablets. 
it to the children tablet, correct? I did it differently, but the answer is the same. Mm -hmm. what, what do you do? I only focus on the one and one fourth. Mm -hmm. So I converted the one fourth into a decimal. I That's ended fine. up with 1.25. Perfect. And 1.25 multiplying to four is, well, basically it's five divided by 1.25 is. Yes. Four. And it's then correct. I times it into two. Yeah, right, it's perfect. So you just use a decimal approach. That's good. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so we have, um, if you look at what do you call it, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, you know, relatively very similar to what we've done, you know. 5% increase here, you have five, one, one and a half percent, five and a half percent increase, you know. If you look at that, very similar, okay. So I'm going to, I know we are all tied. We are all tied. So we'll pause here, number 25. Next week, it's a time for more problems. Um, so we're going to spend, whatever time after the, we go through the exercises, we'll do a math. We will spend a lot of time on the math next week. You know, I want us to at least finish some of of um, test one, usually I try to finish one, two, three, test, up to test three, if we can finish up to test three, that'll be great. If we can get to test four, that'll be excellent, you know. Um, but basically the math will be like a repetition of what, all that you've done, if you look at the exercises, a lot of repetition, okay. So once we do a couple of them, I believe we should be fine going forward, you know, but definitely, Next week is practice day. So we'll do more, more, more math practice next week. Okay. Um,